Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Mom says that I can't get a higher paying job all because I would move out. If you think the title is bad, just wait. So my mom had insisted that I stay with her for my job during lockdown. It's still going on where I live. So I did and I regretted it to the point that I'm losing more money than my job can pay me. I have a job at Amazon in their distribution center. Basically, I sort the packages to get to the customer's residence. I have the night shift and it sucks. I have mental health issues and night shift plus stress from my mom plus the drive made me look elsewhere for work. I found a good job that pays more, about $8.80 more than what I make now. It's in the daytime, that's the best bit. That's where the problems start. So my current job has me drive 100 miles round trip and needs my gas and mileage like Pac-Man and his pellets. I get roughly $19 an hour, but the reason this is worse? Mom expects me to pay her $500 a week for rent. My paycheck is roughly $760. Take away $500 and I have $260 left. After making payments on my car, which is $180, I have $80 to pay for gas. Gas where I am is $398 a gallon. I use up nearly $60 to fill up from when the gas light turns to full. So yeah, I need somewhere else. Now my new job, which I start in 3 days after writing this, is in the day and is remote. I can work from home as long as I have a computer of sorts, a smartphone and internet. The job pays more and my mother saw my texts to my grandparents about it. Well, guess who decides to tear me a new one? If your guess was my entitled mother, you'd be right. Now, my mom doesn't take care of the house, at least since I came back. I have to vacuum, fix anything that breaks, mow the lawn, cook, and take care of my sister. That doesn't sound like an entitled mom, that sounds like you being a member of the household. I know that's what you're thinking. Well, let's put her back to the way of the entitled mom. 1. Mowing the lawn has to be done on Fridays between 9 and 10 a.m. My night shift doesn't let me out until 11.50. And even then, it's a 40 minute drive if there's no traffic. With traffic, I'd be lucky to be home by 2.30 p.m. So I get chewed out for not having it done by then. Two, I can't get any sleep until I finish my chores. Now I need to sleep from 5 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. So I can't get enough sleep. She won't let me go to bed until well after 9 p.m. So on two and a half hours of sleep, I have to drive 50 miles on a busy highway that's under construction, mind you. 3. I have no personal property. I have a phone that she bought me as a 17th birthday present. She is now handing me the bill for the darn phone. She bought me an iPhone XR brand new for like $1000. I got a military grade protector case and a shatterproof screen cover. She demanded that I turn off my passwords for all of my devices that I paid for. So aside from the $500 rent, I now have to pay $1000 for a birthday gift to me. She adds $50 a week for interest. 4. She has to read all of my emails, texts, see all my contacts, hear every phone call on speaker, and can use my laptop as she likes. I had to purchase antivirus software after I got 9 on my laptop. She gets into my spam and clicks the links. You know, the, you want a free iPad, click here to receive it. I had to use money that I don't hardly have to purchase antivirus software that keeps the viruses off the system. 5. Any food that I buy, she eats instantly, claiming that it's her reward for raising me. 6. My Nintendo Switch that I bought and have a 5 year warranty on was sold to a pawn shop. It still had my login info, credit card, PayPal, about $259 in gift cards and $412 in rewards points and an $89 512GB microSD card. My Switch was worth a lot and she sold it for 50 bucks. Yes, 50 bucks. But thank God that when they booted it up, they saw my contact info in the account settings. I got called asking why it was sold with all of the stuff still on it. I told them that I didn't sell it and had a warranty for another three years on it. 
Well, I got it back without any hassle. The Switch itself was my purchase. Anything else was family members sending me gift cards after gift cards for it. Needless to say, that new job is my ticket out of here. I put in my two weeks notice already, so I'm ready for the new job. I can pay her ridiculous fees and save up enough to get an apartment again to get away. I'm going no contact with her. Not my sister, but her. Now seeing that this new job is better pay, and in the day when she's at her job, she decides that I have to stay with Amazon because I can't do remote work from her house. So apartment hunting I go. I got a car, but she holds the title deed. It's her car. But I'm shelling out hundreds a month so she doesn't have to pay for it. Well, guess who has to get a new car without her name on it? Me. I want to get out of this place, but she's emotionally and mentally manipulative. She says that this new job isn't going to pay me this right off the bat. The paycheck is what's management, HR, and I agreed upon. It's in my contract, and if they violate it, that's a hefty fine. She then tells me that those hours are fake, once again agreed upon and in my contract. 38 to 40 hours a week, any more, and I get paid overtime. Now she's trying to get family members involved to get me to stay with Amazon. They all say she's crazy. Well, now I have her crazy friend group on Facebook that think I'm a minor. I can grab a beer whenever I want. So yeah, she's the mother of the year material. I can't stand her. Edit. Thanks for all of your responses. You guys got some good advice down in the comments. I've got some arrangements set up. I'll be moving either later this afternoon or sometime tomorrow. Just thanks for your kind words. Picky penny pinchers get upset when they have to share a dining room. When I was in college and worked at the infamous never-ending pasta bowl chain restaurant, a woman and her husband carrying a baby came in and requested to sit at the back of the restaurant in the empty room because their baby was a sensitive sleeper. The hostess informs them that the room is empty because it is a reserved room for a high school prom's dinner, but she can check with a waiter and see if they are okay serving one of the back corners and they will put the prom party at the front of the room because it was really only like 15 people and the room set 60. Hello, I am the waiter. The host comes and asks me if I'm okay with it. I say go for it. I come to the table and take their drink order. Being quiet for the little one. Come back with their drinks and set them down. I take their order. The woman wanted chicken parmesan with no cheese and the man ordered his as such. You know, around six months ago when you guys had the northern tour of Italy, there's a mushroom Alfredo on there. I want the steak gorgonzola, but I want the mushroom Alfredo instead of the regular pasta and sauce, and I do not want the balsamic glaze that comes on the steak pieces. It is disgusting, and I will send it back. I also do not want Alfredo. Add mushrooms and steak, because it is not the same. Luckily for this man, I know exactly what dish he's talking about. Now the infamous question. Soup or salad? They tell me they want both, and the salad needs to be no tomato, extra croutons, extra onions, no olives. They want three cups of dressing on the side. For the soups, they want two bowls, each with two of the four soups poured in together, but not stirred. I'm over this already. I inform them that there will be a charge to have both. It's about $5. They flip a lid, demanding to speak to a manager. Manager comes out and agrees to comp it this time, but they should be aware in the future it's standard practice. I get the floor manager and the kitchen manager and describe the guy's meal to them to ensure there is no lost translation about exactly what this already irate man wants. They say they've got it covered. Bring out overly complicated soup and salad, as well as hot breadsticks, set everything down. Would we like cheese? I lift my little cheese grater up and begin churning, asking when to stop. After three revisits to the kitchen and five blocks of Asia Go cheese later, they finally call it off. As I turn to leave, they laugh and say, You can leave the cheese grater here if you want. I laugh and inform them that I'm not allowed to do that, but I will check in regularly in case they need more. I give them more cheese here and there while waiting on their food. When I bring out the food, I'm honestly excited. I hate dealing with rude customers, but it's nice to overcome adversity, and I'm pretty sure I nailed this one. I set their food down, and I can tell immediately the guy is upset. I ask him what's wrong with his food. Nothing. Whatever. Forget it. I'll just eat it. I'm sorry if there's something wrong with your meal, sir, but if you let me know what I can do to fix it, I would be happy to. 
There's nothing you can do. I'll just eat this. It's fine. At this point, hostesses are beginning to shuffle in the prom kids. I ask if anyone wants cheese. The woman speaks up and is now yelling. We want you to leave the cheese grater like we asked you to the first time. And how in the heck do you expect me to eat my meal looking at that? She gestures behind me to the prom table. The room has gone dead silent and I turn around to look. I see a group of teens with a range of different disabilities in beautiful dresses and tuxedos. I can see that they, and the people escorting them, have heard what she just said. My manager walks up immediately with to-go boxes and tells them they need to leave now. That what she said was disgusting and he will not stand for it. The woman starts screaming as they get up to leave that she will call corporate and blah blah blah. As she walks out of the lobby, she says, Tell your waitress jerk to put that cheese grater where the sun don't shine. The weirdest thing about it all, the baby never woke up. I got one company shut down and two more fined by the state of North Carolina. To get started, I, for the past four to five years, have been working as a state certified security for several companies. I tend to make it about a year before being completely done with the BS at one company before moving on to the next one. My story begins at my first security job ever. We shall call the company first for the purpose of this post. I have never done security before, but my brother has been working in the field and helps me get the job at first. North Carolina has laws that regulate this profession and require all field employees to go through state certification for unarmed security, if working without a firearm, or both the unarmed and armed certifications if working with a firearm. This will be important later. I went through this training and passed my unarmed certification just fine, it is a pass slash fail system, and began my new job enforcing rules for low income apartment complexes, oof. After about 6 months, I got a promotion, a whole 50 cent pay raise and a lot of new responsibilities. These new responsibilities often required about 4 to 10 hours of paperwork, phone calls and other manager duties that could not be done on site at the apartment complex per company regulation but could be done at home using Dropbox or other websites. After about 9 months, first decided they wanted to arm all managers and we went through the class and I passed again. Then after about a year, the other managers and I started realizing that we should be paid more, now $11.50 an hour, and hadn't been receiving most of our off-site 4 to 10 extra hours of work pay each week. We started conversations with the owner, Billy, not close to his name at all. He refused us extra pay and claimed he didn't pay us for the extra time because it wasn't approved by him first. I know this isn't r slash Melissa's compliance, but cue it anyway. We all started tracking our unpaid work, making sure to get every second of extra work approved, or most of the time not. Also, we only worked when approved. This caused First's paperwork to die a slow death from neglect. Then, after about three months of this, we all had found new jobs and quit on the same week leaving him with no managers. After my time at first, I now had a glowing review from my previous manager, who quit along with the rest of us, and a bit over a year of experience both as a regular guard and a manager. This allowed me to get a good job at a new company, we shall call this company Second. Second was much better than first. I was brought on as a regular guard with mentions of possible promotion after 6 months. Also, my pay was $12.50 an hour. I worked there for about a month and then informed them that my unarmed and armed certifications received at First World would be expiring within 60 days and I would need to recertify before it expired. This is very common in my field because the certifications only last one year before needing to be recertified. In return, I get vague promises of upcoming classes. 60 days came and went and I hadn't been scheduled for a class despite reminding them every couple of weeks. I would like to say that I stopped working when it expired, but I didn't. I needed the money and they kept promising classes. After about 3 months of this, my old manager from first, the one that recommended me to second, contacted me and told me that she was starting up a new company and asked if I would want to come on board. Due to a few minor problems with second, as well as me violating both state and federal law working armed with an expired certification, I jumped at the opportunity. I put in my two weeks notice and informed the second that I couldn't work for those two weeks due to the violations regarding my certificates. State law requires them to pay me during this time because it is 100% on the company to get me trained. 
My start at 3rd, not the real name. During my two weeks notice, I signed up with 3rd and they put me through my required classes. After that, I started. Work was hard. We only had one contract, but that contract was 24-7 and there were only two of us. It would be me working for 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day and my coworker working nights, then rinse and repeat. We did this for about two weeks until a few new employees came on board and evened out the hours. I worked there for about a year. During this year, Third had some bumps in the road financially speaking. Occasionally, I wouldn't be paid my entire dues, but it was always fixed with my next paycheck. So despite these rough patches, I kept on. The owners didn't know everything they needed to about running a business and were learning through trial and error. We had some awful Craigslist employees and almost lost our one contract on multiple occasions due to the awful employees. Despite these issues, we had a small, good core of employees. After a year of this, I was promoted, but strangely, my pay didn't go up. In hindsight, I should have been able to predict the future from this. I liked having the manager role officially, but unofficially, I had been doing all of the extra work since third's inception, so no real changes to my duties. After all this, it happened. Cue the beginning of the end. The owners decided to not pay us for lunches. This seems small, but for me, this meant about five hours a week of pay loss. Keep in mind, we could not leave site for lunch and had to sit at the desk and answer the door every five minutes or so to perform searches of guests entering the building. I informed the owners that it violated federal law labor to do this and most of the employees ate very quickly to minimize downtime anyway. What we were doing is defined as on-call lunches. This means that we may be interrupted during our lunch at any time to do work-related tasks. On-call time has to be paid. I fought with the owners for about a month and realized they were not going to change, so I started digging into company records to see if there were any other cost-saving measures being used. I also kept very close track of my missing pay. To my horror, I found a few. We had a few employees that were not armed certified. The full class is about $500 per employee and is required by the state. The lunch thing, that violated federal labor laws. And there were also a few instances where earned overtime was pushed to the next week so the company wouldn't have to pay out time and a half. This violated our employee contracts as well as federal labor law. I got all this information written up into a five page packet that included plain text of the violations legal text of the violations, the legal code numbers being violated, so third could easily look them up, as well as legal fixes for these issues. These fixes were put in simple terms. 1. Pay the owed back pay and stop for their violations, the cheapest option. 2. Be sued sometime down the road by an employee or a group of employees, potentially the most expensive option. 3. Report themselves to the Labor Commission and Certification Board. The state will work with companies to help them fix their issues and often waive fines and fees to ensure the company fixes itself. 4. Be reported to both the federal government and state boards. My personally favorite and very expensive. I honestly didn't think they knew and would jump at the chance to fix their issues. I had a meeting with the owners and explained everything. To my horror, they knew everything. At this point, I started looking for new work and finally found it. Now at 4th, they put me into the certification system and to my horror, it turns out that I had been working for two and a half years without a certification. Both 2nd and 3rd never bothered paying the $14 fee to have my records updated. For a bit of info, I'm responsible for informing my employer when my expiration dates are coming up and passing the classes. That is it. It is completely on the company to do the rest of the legwork. I was upset. I started getting all my records in order from both 2nd and 3rd. While doing that, I remembered first that it had cut my pay for over 200 hours of unapproved work. I decided to add that to my case, so I filed both 1st and 3rd's violations with the Federal Labor Board along with all my records. Then I went and filed 2nd and 3rd with the North Carolina Certification Board. I presented all my records and wrongdoings, working uncertified. They understood and told me I had done everything in my power at the time and would not be held accountable. After about a year, I finally was told what happened to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. The federal government went through 1st and 3rd's records and found everything I had submitted and more. 1st was able to afford the fallout and paid about $50,000 to past employees as well as some fines. 
third was fined around $300,000 and had to reimburse all the employees wronged. These payments were the owed amounts plus a fine equaling 200% owed amount to each employee wronged. Then the state certification board fined both second and third around $10,000 per employee who worked unarmed and was given a stern warning. In the end, first was fined $50,000 plus fines, unsure of the total amount. Second was fined about $70,000 and is now on the crap list of the certification board. Third was fined over $600,000 and went out of business, still waiting for them to cut my check. I was informed later that I could have sued them and gotten more. However, I didn't want personal satisfaction as much as I wanted them to learn their lesson. I feel that they did. Lady refuses to pay for products she damaged because she doesn't need it. A lady in her 30s came into my store today and asked if we had clear treat bags to put small candies in. We were all out, so instead I showed her the only thing we had left on the shelf. A pack of opaque silver foil wrappers for treats, similar to what Hershey's Kisses are wrapped in. She asked me what the difference was between treat bags and foil wrappers, and I explained it to her, but she apparently couldn't understand because she then proceeded to ask me four times each, Are these see-through? And are these bags that you can put candy inside? She was holding the package of wrappers in her hand, and the palm of her hand was not visible, so I honestly do not know how she was not understanding what the product was. I also explained to her four times that the foil wrappers were not bags. They are individual sheets of paper that you wrap around candy. Every time I answered her same two questions, she followed up with, But I need something else, see-through, and but I need bags. We legitimately went in circles for like five minutes until she finally said okay and seemed to understand. I went about my work. A few minutes later, I turned down the aisle to put something away and I saw her open the pack of wrappers and try wrapping something in one of them. I was stunned, but there was a customer waiting to cash out, so I didn't confront the lady then and there. As I was cashing out the other customer, all I could think was, that lady better be paying for those wrappers when she cashes out. But lo and behold, she came up to the cash a few minutes later with two products, neither of which were the wrappers. So I decided I was going to try and overcome my confrontation anxiety in the face of this blatant disregard for store rules. The conversation went as follows. Me. So, are you buying the wrappers, ma'am? No, they're not what I want. Okay, but did you open one of the packages? Giving her an out, even though I saw her with my own two eyes. Yes. Me, sighing internally. Okay, ma'am, I have to charge you for the pack since you opened them. Could you grab the pack you opened, please? But they're not what I want. You told me wrong. Those are wrappers, not bags. I was beyond stunned at this point and irritated that she accused me of explaining it wrong to her when we spent five minutes going over the differences. Me. No, ma'am. I explained to you that those are not clear bags. They're silver wrappers. I think you misunderstood. Well, I can't use those wrappers. I need bags. Me. You still need to pay for them because now they've been opened and can't be resold. But those are wrappers, not bags. You told me the wrong item. I can't use them. This went on for another five minutes until I finally just told her that I would let it go since the wrappers were only $4 but that she's not supposed to open items she doesn't intend to pay for in stores. She seemed a bit apologetic, at least, and genuinely just confused. I went into the aisle after she left and found that she had ripped the package open so aggressively, she tore the barcode and then just left it in the wrong spot on the shelf. Unbelievable that people like this exist. This was my first day back after a 10-day break, and it just affirmed to me that I am just so done with retail. I can only sit in the dining room if I'm eating food. A long time ago, I mean something like 35 plus years ago, I was a wee little kid, about 14 to 15, with a bit of a smarty attitude. I worked at the local pizza place and generally liked my job. My manager was a young 18 to 19 year old lady that the team would hang out with after work and typically just hung out and partied all the time at her apartment. Well, the owner decided that she was a little too young to be the manager so he demoted her to assistant and hired a new general manager. We'll call him Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith ended the employee discount for food and ended our perk of getting to eat messed up orders because he thought that we messed them all up on purpose. 
Plus, he liked to eat anchovies right out of the can. Gross. So he was all around not very popular with the kids on staff, including me. Another rule that he put in place was that during our breaks, we could not sit at any of the tables in the dining area unless we were eating something. But he never specified what we had to eat. Cue the malicious compliance. At this point in history, another pizza chain that was famous for avoiding the noid opened up a test pizza delivery place called Pizza Dispatch. This was a test to see if people would still like the pizza under a different name. The pizzas were 100% the same. The ingredients even had the original chain's name on the boxes. So one night during a really busy shift, I was told to go on break in 15 minutes. So I went to the payphone, we weren't allowed to use the store phones for unofficial business, and called up Pizza Dispatch. They took my order, didn't believe that I wanted it delivered to a different pizza place, but after I explained the situation, they were game. The guy probably didn't believe me still, but they delivered. They even expedited it for me. So 15 minutes go by. I go on break and I sit in the closet that we had for a break area until I hear Mr. Smith ask, What the heck are you doing in here? The delivery guy reached into his bag and said, I have a delivery for JC Macon. I stepped out and said, That's me, under the blistering stare of Mr. Smith. I paid for the pizza, gave a very healthy tip for the speed, then went and sat down at a dining room table, opened my box with my pizza as Mr. Smith came up and tried to make me eat somewhere else. I said, You said that we could only sit in the dining room on our breaks if we are eating. You bring your lunch every day. Today, I brought mine. He got pretty mad, but I didn't push him far enough to get fired. But what did happen is that employees got our discount back. We were able to eat messed up orders, and Mr. Smith ended up teaching me a lot about work ethic how to run a small business, complete inventory, and compute the profit and loss statement each month. This was in the mid-80s, so we didn't have computers in the stores. We did it all on paper. I ended up working for him the entire time he was a manager at our small restaurant and followed him to another chain later on. I still think about him and the lessons he taught me from time to time. While he wasn't a great manager at the beginning, he ended up being a great leader and mentor. Note. I turned off notifications for this post since I'm about to go to bed. Oh, and my wife says I'm still a little crap with a smarty attitude. Pay no attention to the pink sparkly wristband. This happened in 2015. I was managing the hotel packages for Aftershock as well as several other music festivals. In addition to working with the hotels to make sure everyone has a room with fluffy pillows, etc., the job involves distributing tickets, wristbands, swag, merch vouchers, etc., also, lots of questions via text and email. Because I interface with the fans, my email and phone number were at the bottom of the festival website. In fact, my number was the only one listed on the site and my email was one of only three listed. This often caused me grief because I got all sorts of crazy questions that had nothing to do with my job. Many of them had nothing to do with anything festival related at all. The cool thing about this job is that my work is always 80 to 95% done by the time the show starts, so I was free to enjoy the festival. This particular year, we went from lanyards to cloth wristbands for our credentials, which allowed us to go into production areas and backstage, etc. Fans got bands that said general admission or VIP. Vendors got ones that said vendor. Same for guests, media, production staff, etc. Well, they ran out of the nice cloth production wristbands, so they gave me a volunteer wristband. It was plastic, pink, and sparkly, and I didn't really care because it got me everywhere I needed or wanted to be just like anyone else working the show. Well, Sunday night comes and I'm hanging out with some friends who work the box office and they asked if I was heading to production and would I mind taking this huge stack of tickets and merch vouchers back there. I agreed and stuffed about $250,000 worth of paper into my backpack and headed that way. Well, when the headliners go on, we pretty much look down the entrances to the backstage. If you're already in, you can stay. Production staff, artists, etc. are allowed in, but not the bearers of the pink sparkly volunteer wristbands. So I'm at the entrance to the backstage area and the guard is like, you can't go in there. I'm trying to tell him that I'm working the show and I absolutely have to get this stuff back to the production office. He's not having it because I'm obviously just a pink sparkly volunteer trying to get backstage to meet Slipknot or something. So I pull out my phone and I'm calling my coworkers, trying to get someone to meet me to pick up the tickets and stuff, but they aren't answering. 
The guard is cool, but he has his orders, so I wasn't mad at him. He said, if you can get someone on the phone and I can verify that they work for Aftershock, I'll let you in. Then it hits me. I asked if he had a smartphone with him. He did, but he wasn't eager to pull it out when he was supposed to be working, so I pulled out my personal phone and went to the Aftershock website and handed it to him. I had him scroll down and find the only phone number on the page and asked him to call it and ask them if they can authorize me to get backstage. He calls the number and the business phone in my other pocket rings. I answered and said, you can let that guy in. The look on his face was priceless. I asked if he was satisfied and he wasn't sure what to say, so I offered double or nothing. I said, if you scroll down to the email address that says blank at presents.com, I can send you a response so you won't get in trouble for letting me in. He waved me through. Later, I brought him a monster energy drink and some festival swag and thanked him for doing his job so well and being professional. Karen used my money to pay her bills, so I kicked her out. Earlier this year, I decided to move into a three-bedroom apartment. I let a friend of a friend move in with a quick background check and job history. She seemed like a great person at first. We've lived together for five months now, and she doesn't clean up after herself and constantly eats our food. She hasn't cleaned since she moved in and has helped with groceries maybe six times. She also uses my products and my clothes. Well, I happened to check my account online and saw all the money except $4 was left. I called the bank and told them that there was a mistake. They said they will do an investigation and once they find everything out, blah, 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 they will have it in my account, but it will take 10 days from the starting date and we don't know when that'll be. Well, that money was for bills and groceries. I have a nine-year-old kid and I can't not feed my kid. So when roommate got home, she had shopping bags. I told her what happened today and told her the police are also in on it since it was over $1,000 and I couldn't let that slide. She gets antsy and before long is asking how long before they know who it is and I said not long. Not an hour goes by and she comes in crying with my card in hand and says how terribly sorry she is. But she needed things and I had the money before she did and how she was going to pay me back. I told her I was reporting her and was evicting her and to expect a notice to come. She called me cruel and heartless, but she stole from me and my kid to where we don't have any groceries left as she loves to eat our things and not replace them. Am I the jerk for kicking her out or was I too harsh? Edit. One of you suggested to look for other valuable things missing and I'll be darned if my late grandmother's ring is gone. Now I'm calling the police. I mean, I already was before this. But the one ring she knows not to touch is gone. That ring is worth over $20,000 alone. I don't know if she knows, but I never told her the value of it. This infuriates me. First you eat my food, take my clothes and my money, and then you take something worth more to me than money. Is she stupid? She knew that is a definite rule breaker and no going back. I'm calling them now. I'm stressing so bad. Edit. I don't have an update yet. Some things have been said and caught among others, but I figured I would let you all know how I cried knowing this many people cared, and I thank you all so much. I will update you all as soon as I'm able to, and shouldn't be but a couple of days. Thank you all again, and please hang tight. I saw my notifications and got scared for a second, and I'm sorry to the ones I haven't gotten to. Have a good night. Well, what do you think? Is OP overreacting or not? Please let us know. I'd be doing a lot more to that thief than calling the police, but I'm petty like that. I just thought the food was crappy. Just got back from a hot mess disguised as a blind date and wanted to get the details down. It might be a little long, but there's some backstory that's relevant. My fiance, whom I was in a relationship for 10 years with, passed in a car wreck three years ago. The driver of the car was drunk. No, I have no desire to talk about it. When I was a teenager, I got a job working at a movie theater. My last night working there, a plumbing emergency occurred and raw sewage was backing up into the bathrooms and kitchen. I was issued a mop and told to get to cleaning. The kitchen continued to serve food while there was sewage floating on the floor. Yes, the health department was called and there was a legal kerfuffle. I won't eat food at that theater. The cast. We've got Daphne, a friend of my fiance's that I've stayed in contact with. Fred, Daphne's boyfriend with whom I have a much better friendship. Velma a militant vegetarian. Shaggy, yours truly. Scooby-Doo, 
my long-lasting best friend and beloved floof, and the mystery machine, my new car. Daphne called me on Wednesday and informed me that she's upset with the state of my social affairs and a girl she knows from work would love to meet me. I sort of sigh because Daphne is the type of person who thinks the word no is a negotiation tactic and just requires finesse. She can be exhausting. Make no mistake, she means well, but what Daphne wants, Daphne gets. I ask when and where and what the dress code was. I'm informed that it's a date and I should try to avoid looking homeless and the movie is an afternoon show followed by dinner because Fred's got night shift. Myself, Daphne and Velma all work from home. We make goodbye noises and I immediately text Fred for pertinent details because Daphne will gloss over anything that she feels could be problematic. Fred informs me that this chick is super hot and nice and smart and she's also a vegetarian. This raises an eyebrow because that's not something I really would find problematic. When pressed, Fred admits that Velma may give me crap if I order a steak. Fantastic. Well, I'll pretend I'm not a carnivore for one evening and then we can all live happily ever after. I get myself prepared for interactions with other humans, which was a non-trivial process. Hashtag quarantine life. And it's only on Thursday night I realize something important has been forgotten. I text Daphne and make sure she remembered to ask Velma to not wear perfume, or at least not much of it. This is not because I'm opposed to girls smelling pretty. It's because I'm allergic to certain perfumes and colognes. It's not a lethal allergy, but it does make me decidedly uncomfortable. She breezily assures me Velma knows and gushes about how excited she is to ride in the mystery machine and see me again after so long. The day in question arrives and I assure Scooby I'll be back soon and I set off to pick up Fred and Daphne. They come down upon being summoned. Fred jumps in the back and Daphne in the front so she can direct me to Velma's place. We pull up outside Velma's apartment building and Daphne texts Velma and moves to sit in the back with Fred. So we wait and I start showing off some of the cool stuff my car can do. After about 10 minutes of waiting and showing, my inner 12 year old seizes control and I start doing the whoopee cushion thing my car can do. It allows you to make sounds come out of different parts of the car. Myself and Fred are losing it cracking up and Daphne is trying to look stern but her dimples are showing and she's about to crack. Enter Velma. She throws open the door and sternly asks what the heck is wrong with all of us? Are we in kindergarten? Well, all sounds of merriment stop and we all immediately look like chasing school kids. Awkward silence is rather awkward, but there's really no avenue of conversation available when you introduce yourself by berating everyone. After that stellar start, Daphne starts trying to fill the void and get the conversation going and eventually everyone sort of loosens up. But it was just the harbinger of things to come. We get to the theater and Fred and Daphne order their tickets. I'm next and order mine and before I can pay, I feel indignant eyes boring into the back of my skull. And when I look, Velma's giving me a look which clearly communicates I'm apparently buying hers as well. So I do. We make it inside the theater and Daphne, Fred and Velma make for the concession stand while I go nowhere near because I will be darned if I'm going to pay $10 for a medium drink and a medium soda I have zero interest in consuming. We take our seats after concessions are bought and Velma asks me why I didn't get anything to tide me over until dinner. I mention that the food here is not that good and she asks point blank how you can mess up popcorn and soda. I've got zero interest in maintaining a relationship with this woman so I share my story about sewage in the kitchen. If I had cared it would have been about the outrageous cost. Both girls turn an interesting shade of green as they were industriously munching on popcorn before I started the story. I assured them that I used the bathroom and saw no sewage. They were likely fine. Fred laughed when he was suddenly gifted two half-eaten popcorns, which he demolished. The Bond movie plays, everyone liked the movie and it was off to the Italian restaurant for dinner. We make it to the restaurant and get seated immediately and are issued a basket of the excellent breadsticks this place is known for. Velma excuses herself to the bathroom and Daphne, Fred and I are discussing the movie and what we want to eat. When Velma comes back, she can be smelled before she is seen and sits back down at the table smelling like she'd just been dunked in a vat of perfume. My eyes immediately redden. I can feel a migraine start brewing and I fight the urge to cough because allergies. Our waitress stops by and introduces herself and asks if she can get us some drinks. Fred orders a beer, Daphne orders a cocktail, Velma orders a cocktail and I order myself some delicious apple juice off the kids menu. 
The stuff is delicious and blends in better with the boozy drinks than a soda would. Velma is made curious by my selection and asks me if I drink. I assure her that I do socially, but not when I'm driving. She makes a pfft sound and dismisses that with an airy wave of her hand and blithely informs me that I shouldn't worry so much. She drives all the time with a few drinks in her. I assure her I'm quite content with my apple juice and start counting in my head because there's no way this girl could know. Daphne frantically inserts herself into the conversation and the conversation is guided away from sensitive subjects and everyone starts to relax. Waitress returns with drinks and begins taking everyone's orders. This restaurant helpfully labels different entrees with an S for people with different dietary needs. Fred, Daphne, and Velma all order their meals, and when it comes to me, I order a cheese-stuffed food, which I will not embarrass by attempting to spell, which comes with marinara sauce, which is labeled with a nice green asterisk, meaning it's safe for leaf eaters. Waitress says the food will be here shortly, and before she's made it five feet, Velma starts in on me for ordering something with red sauce. Apparently, she did that once, and the server confused marinara with bolognese. Tells me I should call the waitress back and reorder it with Alfredo sauce. I assure her I'm quite content with my choice, and if it comes back with meat, that's not really a problem for me. Fred's wincing by that point, and Daphne is desperately trying to get Velma's attention. Velma is evidently so incensed by my cavalier attitude, she actually has the nerve to ask me how I could be so disrespectful. I couldn't help it. I just laughed at her. When she asks precisely what's so funny, all the rage I'd been keeping bottled for Daphne's sake just goes cold and seeps out. In a tone that was so dispassionate, it was unnerving, I asked why she expected respect, but gave none. I started ticking points off on my fingers. Did this crap show not start with her berating us for having fun while she made us wait? Did she not give the impression she was entitled to a free movie ticket just for breathing? Did she not just come back from the bathroom doused in perfume, which she was told I was allergic to? Did she not blithely endorse driving tipsy, considering how I lost my wife? And now she has the nerve to object to someone's food choice, which was made with her preference in mind, out of respect to her, mind you, because it might come back with meat? But I'm being disrespectful? I stood up and went in search of our waitress so I could clear my portion of the tab. I guess I seemed pretty angry because everyone magically moved out of the way and the waitress definitely raised an eyebrow once I tracked her down. She rang me up and gave me my copy of the receipt and I tipped her at least $20 over the total because she deserved it given what I would left her to deal with. I did mention that my table might need some extra napkins on the way out. Update. Fred texted me first and complimented me on my power move, asked if my jewels were okay because they were dragging on the ground on the way out. Daphne texted this morning, pleading for me not to hate her, claiming she knew her friend Velma was a little snippy sometimes, but had no idea she was that bad. I assured her that I do not hate her, but did want to have a bit more of a say in who she introduced me to in the future. She promises this will be the case. We'll see if she remembers. Fred said after I left, he was trying so hard to not start laughing and making everything worse for Daphne. He even managed to keep it together while both girls tried to figure out what to do. Completely lost it when the waitress bought over a mound of napkins, which caused Velma to burst into furious tears. He didn't know if it was him laughing or the napkins that started the waterworks, but it was bad. They got separate Ubers to go home. Manager tells me I have a month to get better or get another job. I was content. It's close to home and interesting enough, despite gradually destroying my clothes and body and mental health. Well, one month ago today, he pulls me into his office to tell me that my foreman thinks I'm too slow, that I'm not picking up techniques quickly enough, and that I don't really seem excited enough to work in a warehouse, that I make too many mistakes, and that he's not going to keep me on at the end of my probation at this rate. Then finished it off with, Mate, you need to sort it out or get another job. So I explained that I've never been late once, never called in sick. I treat everybody with respect, I always finish up all of my work, then make sure my bay is clean, then help other people finish theirs. He interrupts and tells me F bay is the easiest bay, which turns into a conversation where he threatens to put me in the most dangerous and difficult bay. I say that I've been known to occasionally pull the wrong length out, but I've seen the other people completely load trucks with the wrong stock, and I tell him that my bay is hands down the cleanest bay in the warehouse, which is apparently the cleanest warehouse owned by that company. So I think, forget it. My foremen are jokers and take very little seriously. 
One of them likely said something as a joke that my GM took seriously, and a little conversation will sort it out. I pull the foreman for that week to the side and explain the situation, and he says, I want you on the crew, mate. I think you're a good lad. So I figure it's probably the other guy anyway. His jokes are usually the, you're crap and I'm the best variety, so it would make sense. So I plan to ask him the next day at shift changeover. Then I get there the next day, and the first thing I hear is my bay took three men, including the GM himself, 40 minutes to clean, and the GM is upset, which got a genuine good laugh out of me. Turned out they were completely serious. I completely forgot about talking to my other foreman and asked the guys who cleaned my bay about it. They told me it was already clean and they had to lay on the floor and reach underneath stacks of steel to pull out loose pieces of paper and whatever they could find. About an hour into my shift, I'm upset and the GM comes to rub it in my face. I mentioned that I performed a lift in eBay earlier that day and four pieces of loose bonding, which are slash, stab, and tripping hazards, fell off of it. In an attempt to make the point that why walk past every bay with actual hazards in them to clean my bay, which had zero. The sociopath gives me this little crap-eating grin, shrugs, and says, Yeah? Which had a bully's, what you gonna do about it, vibe to it. That's when the penny dropped. I had heard about him messing with people for the sake of it, and right now he can mess with me for a month, and then use it as an excuse to extend my probation, keeping me on literally the bare minimum they can legally pay me for another six months. So I put on my poker face to not give him the satisfaction, and any complaint has met with a pretty blank, okay. So for the month just gone, I've spotted every mistake coming from the office. Usually we just cross things out and correct them because the guys in the office don't have a clue. But if I see 125 by 65 millimeters at 11.3 MCH, I know what and where it is without needing the rest of the sheet. I haven't made a single mistake for the month. They're a regular occurrence for everybody. You're told they don't matter unless they leave the warehouse. That is, except of course, for the GM apparently. The office had made about two to three a day, which I've taken to the GM personally to have corrected. I'm teaching my foreman tricks that he didn't know. Literally three days out of five, I taught him something. My bay is insanely clean, to the point that I'd argue I clearly must have been wasting time to get it that clean. I've been getting friendly with the director of the company. He's actually a really nice guy as it turns out. But basically, my performance has been not just the great performance they usually get from me, they've gotten such an amazing performance that it's absurd. The last I was told was that I'm going to be fired today or that I'd better get another job or sort out my performance. Well, before the lockdown, I happened to be a pretty decent bartender slash manager. I just landed hands down the best job of my career. I'm going to be a head bartender at a four-star hotel spa and gold course with marble columns and a driveway with a flower feature, a waterfall, and a view of their giant grounds just on the driveway. Not all of my fingers bend like they used to. My toes have corns between them. My back and one of my shoulders are in constant pain, and I've got two new scars from six months in that place, including what I call the 1.5 T punch to the stomach I took, and I swear I've had a bad stomach every day. So I did my performance out, I did get another job, and I did quit through HR with no notice and reported that jerk for bullying. Edit. To those saying this wasn't malicious compliance, he didn't want or expect me to actually leave. His plan was to mess with me for a month and tell me every way that I suck at the job personally every time he got an excuse. Then at the end of my probation expected me to beg and thank him for continuing my probation and by extension denying me a raise. I wasn't doing my job well because I was told to. I was doing my job well to take away any ammo he could possibly have had to mess with me and gave him no excuse to. Then at the last minute with no notice, this wasn't explained in the post to be fair, but also two men down. I left with no notice. He told me to improve or find another job. I did both and both times denied the sociopath the satisfaction of berating me, then left with him knowing that not only did he not get his way, he actually pushed me into improving my life in a way that makes his life harder, by doing exactly what he asked. Edit 3. For the person who wanted more about me quitting. It wasn't very exciting. The GM isn't there at the end of my shift. I cleaned out my locker at the end of my shift on Friday, handed my foreman my key and clock in fob and told him I've got a better job. He wished me luck and I left. Closest thing to exciting things that happened were the day I answered my phone on the shop floor because I didn't give a hoot. 
That got me a few looks, since most people hide to answer their phone, but I was just casually standing by my desk. Also, the other day, somebody left for lunch five minutes early, and the foreman was doing out a group punishment for everybody. I go to walk past him at the usual time. He says, slow down. Me. Want a hand? Foreman. No, just slow down. Me. I'm standing still now. I can't get any slower than this. Do you need help with something? Foreman. Just wait there a minute. Context. That's just how people talk to each other in a warehouse. He's a jerk for the whole collective punishment thing, but the way we speak to each other is, if anything, affectionate in a weird, toxic way. Then I just walked off. I actually needed a bathroom break, which he can't stop me from doing. With walking the length of the warehouse, my bay was the furthest. The conversation with him and going to the bathroom, the five minutes were up. He was standing outside the door to the bathroom when I walked out, looking upset. I just look at my watch, raise my eyebrows a little, as though I'm surprised at the time, and walk to get my headphones from the locker. He's not daft, though if anyone told him I said that, I'd deny it. And he knows that when he's being a jerk, I'm likely to mess with him for it. He had nothing to say, but he really wanted to. He gave me the cold shoulder for about an hour before Dancing Queen came on the radio and we were singing it like idiots. He did also make me sheet every truck for the rest of the shift, which in fairness, I kind of deserved. There was one coworker I told I got the job and we had a big high five before I went back to my bay. Apparently, the foreman asked him what the heck that was about and he said, I don't know. Mogley1992 just high-fived me and walked off, and the foreman didn't even question it, which I thought was hilarious. A Karen and a loud comeuppance. So I've always been a very self-confident type of person, but also easygoing and always doing my best to be decent to people. I was just brought up that way. I also expect it from others and have absolutely zero patience for people who think it's okay to act out or be blatantly rude. One afternoon, I was at a Wally World, trying to do some shopping. I hadn't thought much about it, but I happened to be wearing the store's colors. A dark blue button-up shirt, neat jeans, and nice work shoes. I'm a trucker and was wearing a shirt for my company. I just like to dress nice and look respectable and dress like this all the time. At any rate, I then hear it. A Karen in the wild. A forceful clearing of the throat. Ahem, excuse me. I turned to look, and I kid you not. I wouldn't have believed anyone could look like this stereotype, but there she stood. Business attire and shoulder length, straight platinum blonde hair, a huge, the world bows to my whims attitude. She gazed at me sternly, her eyes steely, her demeanor as if she were about to berate a servant who had erred. I stared, silent for a moment, gathering back a swell of irritation at just seeing the attitude this lady had, then just simply blurted, what? She jerked back, incredulous, as though I had just attacked. But she was also quick to recover. Her look of steely-eyed and now very justified outrage staring out at me from within her perfectly straight platinum blonde locks. Employees should not speak to customers in such a fashion, she informed me. Yep, she used those exact words and did inform me as though I had done something very wrong by addressing such an important customer in such an impertinent manner. My brow just went up. That was all. But I said in a very level tone, I don't work here. Then I turned away from her, just intent on going back to my shopping. You do not turn away from me, she seethed from behind me, then went so far as to grab the back of my suspenders. I very calmly turned back around, looked down at her for a second, I'm six foot, and she was like five foot and a half or something. Then I leaned down very close to her face. This was long before lockdown, and I began in a very low voice. I said, then raising my voice to its loudest by the word finished with, I do not work here. By the time I was out with here, I was so loud I could have been heard all the way through this superstore. I even think I blew her hair back a little. The look in her face was wonderful. Ah, ah. I'm sorry, she stammered. I thought you were... I cut her off. Thought I was employee. Yes. I was still dead in her face, my eyes now ten times harder than hers could ever be. Which you thought gave you the right to speak to me and treat me as though I was beneath you. I leaned in even closer. She stood, spellbound, a viper and mouse. She the mouse, me the viper. Well, I got news for you, lady. Buying stuff from a store and spending a little money does not grant you license to belittle people. 
at which point I straightened and then did turn on my heel and walked away from her. While she stood there, gaping like a fish out of water, absolutely speechless. It was delightfully wonderful. Don't want to fix my IT issue? Well, I think it's time for a new CTO. I just want to state that this IT issue is going to blow some people's minds. The security flaw that this presented was nothing short of incredible, and the fact that we never had a major security breach is astounding. It truly is. The flaw, you may ask? Everyone in the entire company's password was the same password. Yes, folks, you read that right. Every single password to every single employee login was the same password. It was like this before I joined the company and for quite a few years after. Until, well, enjoy the story. Now, what about the username? That must have been the trick, right? Oh yeah, that was a trick. The username was the employee email address. I did point out this flaw to my management and their response was, that's not our area to be concerned about. So whatever, it paid well, I'll do my job. And then one day, we had a Windows update, which caused a piece of the software I used to work to break. I submitted a help ticket, and after escalating the issue, I got to the CTO. It wasn't a huge company. The CTO said, I don't want to spend the time fixing this. Use this workaround. To which I pointed out, the workaround slows things down, makes my job harder, and this Windows update has to affect more than just me. I was told to suck it up. Now, at the time, the CEO was the son of the founder and a bit of a jerk. I legit feel at this point in time, he was just collecting a paycheck and letting everything run on auto and didn't pay attention. But I was mad at the CTO for brushing me off, so I pinned an email to the CEO. It was a short email and I simply said, I discovered a massive security flaw that could potentially expose us to huge liabilities. When would be a good time to discuss this? The response, what security flaw? I decided to demonstrate the flaw. I picked two random salespeople, I didn't know them. I got their username and I logged into their systems. And I pulled two random customers' personal information, the kind of information that would have easily allowed me to commit identity fraud, pull out credit in their names, etc. All kinds of bad stuff. I emailed the CEO and I explained, anyone who knows the URL to log into our system can log into anyone's account, pull up customers' information, and everyone has the same password. To prove this, I logged into two employees' random accounts and pulled two different customer profiles and I've attached them. One single disgruntled employee could do us over. 25 minutes later, my phone rings. It's the CEO. He was nice, very interested in how I did this. This guy isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. And I pointed out the flaw in plain English and the liability that it presents to him. I walked him through the process of hacking my own account as he called it. I'd hate to call it hacking because it was easy. Now it dawned on this CEO that this liability was huge. I pointed out again in our conversation a single upset employee could destroy us. The fact that it hadn't happened already was nothing short of a miracle. I get told that they want me to present this to the executive team so they can discuss a solution. Honestly, the solution is obvious. So a day later, we have the conference call. It's the CEO, the CTO, COO, CFO, the company lawyer, the senior VP, etc. And on the call, I demonstrate the flaw and I lay out how I, as a lay person with very little IT background, was able to figure this out. It's incredible that we have this flaw. Everyone is in agreement that this is a huge issue, except the CTO. The CTO gets very upset at me and he wants me fired for hacking the system. He says that per our employee handbook, what I did is a fireable offense. I point out that I'm not abusing this loophole and I'm only doing it to expose the flaw because I care about the company and I think this is something that needs to be brought forward. I point out that a former disgruntled employee could log into an account and steal customers' personal information and if that were traced back to us, the liability would be huge. I could tell our corporate attorney agreed with me and he was shocked at what I was demonstrating. The CTO pointed out that former employees' usernames are disabled, to which I pointed out every employee username is their email address. It would be trivial for a former disgruntled employee to use a different employee email address that they remember to log in, and since everyone's password is the same, they don't even have to guess. The CTO points out that we would know who did it because of the IP address. I pointed out that VPNs are indeed a thing. The corporate attorney actually wasn't familiar with what VPNs do and I explained it. 
And what shocked me is the whole time, the only person in the meeting who didn't agree this flaw needs to be changed was the CTO. The CEO made it clear that this issue would be fixed by the end of business that day and there were no ifs and buts about it. The meeting ended. After the meeting, the CTO called me. Privately, he was mad. I just exposed his incompetence because the system was his design. The decision for everyone to have the same password was his decision, and I know why he did it. He did it because he was lazy. And I said to the CTO, You're a crappy CTO. You shouldn't be in the position you are. And you're lazy. You should have found a better solution for my help ticket. He stops and asks, So this is about your stupid help ticket? I go, Yes, yes it is. He laughs and says he's going to have me fired. And I laugh and go, I'm pretty sure someone is getting fired. I'm also super confident that it's not going to be me. Well, sure enough, later that day, we got an email stating that everyone was to change their passwords to something unique. A week later, the CEO announced the old CTO stepped down to spend more time with his family. On the first day of the new CTO tenure, he sent me an email telling me he wanted to personally work on my help ticket and find a solution around the whole Windows update, which I'm pleased to say he did. And I later had conversations with our attorney at a meeting we legit never had a security breach, which is simply astounding. The attorney admitted that was just plain dumb luck on our part, and if we would have had a security breach, it would have been very bad for us. Stepdaughter smashes her phone for a TikTok challenge and expects me to buy her a new one. I, 45 male, and my wife, 46 female, got married in December of 2019. I have a daughter, Cheryl, who's 16 with my ex-wife. My ex-wife passed when my daughter turned two. My wife has a daughter with her ex, Natalie, 17 female. Her ex-husband decided he did not want to be a part of Natalie's life. Natalie thinks I will abandon her like her father did, but I promised her that I was here for the long run. Natalie and Cheryl get along okay. Natalie works part-time at a local chain. For Cheryl's recent birthday, I bought her a PlayStation 5 and a few games. For Natalie's, I bought her a brand new iPhone and some clothes. She broke the phone and we got her a new one through warranty. Natalie has claimed multiple times that I favor my daughter over her, which is untrue. Natalie came home from school and showed us the broken phone. It was completely smashed and we asked what happened. She told us a story about a TikTok trend that's going around where people smash their phones and then are rewarded with a new one. My wife and I looked at her and told her that we did not have a new phone to give to her. Natalie freaked out and started screaming at us. My wife told her to go to her room and stay there the rest of the night. My wife's parents called us a few hours later, calling me a horrible stepfather and showing favoritism between the kids. Am I the jerk for not purchasing my stepdaughter a new phone? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Natalie? Please let us know. I'd reward her with a 2001 Nokia. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. It's not about the dog toy. It's about sending entitled jerks a message. Backstory. I live in the basement floor of my parents' house. My name is on the title. There was a bit of financial kerfuffle that required my assistance. We have two dogs, one bearded collie named Abby who loves my dad and a cockatoo named Dexter who is my bud. Important note about Abby, she is a toy shredder. The only kind of dog toys that last in the house are made of rubber or are too big for Dexter to get a good grip on. A few months back, Dexter and I attended an agility course, and at the end of that course, Dexter was presented with a bucket full of dog toys and allowed to pick one to take home. He pulled out a purple fuzzy monkey thing that had some skinny ropes coming out. Forgive me if I slip and call it a tug monkey. Now, Dexter loved playing with that toy and always remembered where I put it last, so he knew where he needed to sit and stare. When I got this toy, I showed it to both parents and explained that Abby, under no circumstances, is allowed near, as she'd have it shredded in seconds. They both acknowledged and said they get it. I was always very careful to put it up on a shelf when he was done with the monkey and it never journeyed upstairs. Last month, I went out for a little while, and when I came back, Dexter was frantic, flung himself at me, and once he was sure I was looking, sat and stared where I'd last left the toy. The shelf was empty. Fearing the worst, I went to check upstairs, and there's Abby destroying one of the tug ropes and covered in purple shreds of fabric. I was livid. 
When questioned, my mother admitted to giving Dexter the toy and she just forgot the door between halves of the house was open. Before someone suggests a stay in a nice padded room, this is a pattern of consistent disrespect that's been going on since I've moved back and been promised complete autonomy. I put up a whiteboard on the between halves door facing out. If I'm going to be in a Zoom meeting with a camera on or on a call, I used to write in a meeting on a whiteboard. Sometimes this worked, most times it didn't. Mom would just have a laundry basket and decided the stuff needed doing then and figured my call was surely over. It hasn't been yet. I feel like she's walked in on at least five or more calls in the last month where I've been actively speaking and had to mute and cover the camera. I'm only on calls a very small fraction of the day, perhaps an hour or so in total. My boss has commented on distractions and actually had me start speaking less. Did I mention my mother has a tendency to whistle or sing while she's doing chores? Or that one time she derailed an entire meeting because she unleashed a belch so loud it reverberated? This isn't just a quiet blur in the background, it's a real problem. So I load Dexter into my car and we fly to the pet store for an emergency purple monkey replacement. Happily enough, I found the exact same toy. I purchased that and some treats, crisis averted, right? Wrong. We get back to the house and he zips over to where the other toy was, sitting and longing. I take the tags off the replacement and distract him with the treats, put the fake monkey on the shelf and when Dexter resumed his post, I gave him the duplicate, which he sniffed and then snubbed before crying and staring at the shelf some more. I'm a patient man. The BS threshold I have with my parents is set pretty high, but seeing that, my heart broke. There was an Arthur fist. I vowed revenge. I went to the hardware store and ordered a steel interior door. The same keypad lock we already have for exterior doors and some security door hinges. I then had to return the first door and measure first before ordering the correct size. For the next three Sundays, my cousins helped me out with getting everything assembled and adjusted while my parents went to church. The fourth Sunday was spent with a soldering iron lobotomizing the digital code lock so it rejected every code entered. Yesterday, we did the door swap and managed to get everything done and cleaned. When my parents left for church, flimsy particle board door was all that stood between my half and theirs. When they returned, steel door with wood facade, code lock, and tamper-proof hinges. Also wound up changing the code for my exterior door. There was wailing and lamentations and gnashing of teeth. How could you? What about laundry? All this for a dog toy? I calmly explained that the door won't stay closed, but when it is closed, it's staying closed. My name is on the deed of the house now. I can make modifications to my space if I want to. My mother wanted to know what about an emergency. I told her I'd give her the code right now to the new door if she could tell me one situation where minutes mattered. There was hemming and hawing and no actual laundry emergency cited. Why did I spend more than $150 on a door lock only to immediately break it? Because it's got a working deadbolt, which is all I need and my mother spent three hours yesterday trying to brute force the code lock. Why did I spend more than $1,000 on a deadbolt and a door that will sneer at a battering ram? Two reasons. The first being I was mad and wasn't sure anything less would do the trick. And second is because my sister lurks this subreddit religiously and will likely spread this to the rest of my extended family. Hi everyone. It's in the constitution. A man, we'll call Jerk, came up to my ice cream stall today. I'm the manager at a mall food court location. I greeted Jerk and he gave me his order pleasantly enough. I give him his total and he proceeds to try and hand me a $100 bill. We have an in-store policy that we do not take $100 bills. So I just say, I can't break a hundred, which on a normal day with a normal person pretty much handles that. He stares at me at first. Then, what do you mean? This is a legal American note. Me, I understand and I'm sorry, but it's our policy. Well, that's all I have, so you have to take it. Me, I'm sorry, I can't take it. This is legal tender. It's in the constitution that I can use this here. This basically crosses the line for me. I tell him now he's made the situation uncomfortable and I simply can't serve you. He asks for my name, which I stupidly give since I'm directly under the owner and ultimately am upholding her policy. He then straight up calls me a jerk and walks away. I'm shaking at this but think it's over with. I continue taking the people in line so I don't even have to think about it. 
Jerk comes back up not 10 minutes later with his wife, Karen, in tow. She's already charged up and ready to yell. Karen says she has a debit card, but I tell them I still don't feel comfortable serving them. I say first thing, your husband called me a jerk, to which Karen quickly says, because you deserved it. You gave him attitude for no reason. One of my staff members starts arguing with Karen about how it's a store policy that none of us even have control over and it turns into a yelling match. I turn to a different staff member and tell her to go find a security guard. Karen laughs and says a security guard isn't going to do anything. I respond just saying, at least they'll get you away from us. While we're waiting for security, I keep taking orders. Jerk stands at the end of the counter saying I'm going to have a discrimination lawsuit on my hands. I'm going to be dealing with corporate for this. Karen finds one of the real cops that are hired to patrol the mall and brings him over before security shows up. I'm still cheerfully, admittedly literally shaking taking people getting in line while they talk to the cop. Eventually, the cop comes up and says Jerk has admitted that he was in the wrong for the most part, and don't you think we can come to a resolution here? I say I'm sorry, but I still won't be serving them. He says, well, come on, what if I'm here? I'm already frustrated with a shaky voice when I say, that man is using my name to intimidate me. He called me a jerk. There's another place to get what they want two stalls down. They can head there. The cop keeps silent eye contact as if he doesn't really accept this answer, so I offer to just call the owner for him. He slowly shakes his head and says not to worry about it. He goes back to Jerk and Karen, who I can hear, How can they do this? And, Well, how do I get in contact with corporate? As if the cop has a clue. They eventually did go two stalls down. The cherry they couldn't resist to put on top was calling me and my four teenage girl staff members names as they walked back past with their purchase. The entitlement and the audacity, unreal. You're on a performance notice. No raise, no bonus, no work from home, no overtime, and then lockdown happens. So I've posted a few stories about my wonderful old manager. Let's just call her Samantha. This story is about a coworker we will call Joe. And from day one, it was obvious that Joe was one of the hardest working people on the team and Samantha could not stand him. So this is a few years into Joe's tenure with the team and for whatever reason or another, Samantha decides to put Joe on performance notice, which is basically an HR notice that you have six months to get your crap together or you're fired. The reason on the paperwork, improper attitude. Joe was the type of guy to always speak his mind and while management says they live this, Brutal experience shows this is a lie. The problem with notice is, it also comes with penalties. No work from home. They literally take your laptop away and bring you a thin client. No approved overtime and no learning new things or assignments. Oh, and no raise or bonus. You have to prove you do your job well, and then after the six months, if you're not fired, the manager can extend with an additional probation period of another six months. January of every year is when we find out about our raises and bonuses from the previous year. And to put it delicately, that January they did us over, to the point that one person walked out and two older employees, 30 plus years, took packages. Come February, we are drowning, and Joe can't work overtime and Joe can't learn new things. Manager's orders, remember? Well, this is the middle of Joe's probation period, as Samantha predictably extended his notice. So this is where we find ourselves mid-March 2020. Cue malicious compliance. During the lockdown, they send the whole company home. Everyone is working from home except Joe. He is home, just not working. He technically can't, and about two weeks into the lockdown is when Samantha finally notices. She goes ballistic. Why aren't you working? Blah, blah, blah. On a team email with everyone CC'd. He replies all. As you know, I am on coaching and cannot work from home. Tries to get HR to fire him, to which they reply, Samantha, you elected to continue the notice, which still has four months. We can't issue him a laptop until it expires. Turns out the only way to rectify it ASAP was to petition formally with the head of HR that putting Joe on a performance notice was done in error and have all parties sign, including Joe. All this happens, except Joe refuses to sign. He won't sign until they give him his bonus and raise, which they do. The whole thing took a month. A month of Joe basically on a free vacation. Edit. Well, I didn't expect this one to blow up like this. 
but there have been some questions that I feel I need to add some context to. First is the work we do. It's easy. Like a stereotypical corporate job, a concerted effort of maybe three hours a day is enough to do your job. Most people mess around, chit-chat, and milk the day. Some people go even further and milk the work so much that they need help with their workload. We have a coworker who would literally watch Netflix all day. Management either never figured it out or didn't care. I've had days where I've done all my work before lunch and took it easy the rest, and then I've had days where I didn't do a thing all day. Incompetent management creates gray areas. As long as the work gets done, they don't look too deep into who is doing what, and people get away with minimal work. Knowing others will pick up the slack. This is where Joe found himself when lockdown started. The company, which has never had all of its employees, or even a good amount, remote at the same time, was unprepared on how to handle the situation and our managers were even less prepared. Joe literally just found himself forgotten and didn't raise his hand to tell anyone for a bit. Gave her what she asked for. So I'm 17, male, and I got my first job recently, thanks to the people who gave me advice during my first interview. I work as a kitchen staff in a dessert store, selling cookie doughs, waffles, ice cream, churros, etc. So the store works from 1 p.m. until midnight because people crave sugar at night, so it gets extremely busy from evening till night. I work during the evenings and it is very, very busy. There will be an insane amount of tickets for delivery and in-house orders, so there's usually like three or four people in the kitchen. But yesterday I was alone with the owner. One of the kitchen staff is on holiday and others caught sick, their brothers. So I and the owner had to handle the kitchen alone and luckily the owner was extremely fast with his hands and feet, so we were barely able to keep up with the orders until comes, I don't know what to name her, so I'm just going to go with Karen. Karen came alone and ordered a ridiculous order I didn't expect. But before that, and this is what my coworker told me, and I got permission to tell her side, Karen came into the store and demanded she is seated in one of the booths that's for groups. Reason because is that the seats are more comfortable, and I actually agree on that part. But it was annoying for my coworker because she's busy and the other front house member is late, so she's the only one in front of house. And the store is bustling with customers and orders, but she just let it slide and let Karen sit at the booth. Throughout the service, Karen kept annoying my coworker with stupid questions like, Does the strawberry waffle have strawberry? Or, What chocolate does the Nutella waffle have? Etc. Even when my coworker is in the middle of talking to another customer, Karen will rudely interrupt and ask her more stupid questions to the point my coworker had to go to the back room to calm down before coming back out with a forced smile. Anyway, then she made the ridiculous order that made the whole evening go to crap. This was her exact order. Chocolate loco crap with strawberries and red velvet cookie dough on top. On top. She also got a milkshake, which was dumb as well, but she didn't cause an issue over it. It was a Skittle milkshake, but she only wants the red Skittles. We put in red food dye to make it look like it was blended with only the red Skittles. At first, when I read the ticket, I thought there was an error or something and that it was meant to be two separate orders, so I confirmed it with my coworker. Me. Hey, did you make a mistake or something? Coworker. Nope, that's what she wants. She wants the cookie dough on top. I was so confused, but whatever. If it's what the customer wants, it's what they want. But here's the kicker. There's a small window from the kitchen to the front house. We use the window to communicate and send orders. There's also the group booths in front of the window. Karen was sitting there, watching. She heard us and approached us, knowing that we were talking about her order. Karen. Excuse me. I want my order to be thoroughly oven cooked. I don't want it raw or it'll give me an upset stomach. I thought she was talking about the cookie dough because we cooked them in the oven, so I just nodded. Me. No problem. I'll make sure the cookie dough is thoroughly cooked, ma'am. Karen. Uh, and the crab? Me. Oh, yes. It'll be cooked as well. Oven baked, right? Me. What? You're going to oven bake the crab, right? Because if you don't, I won't be able to eat it. Me. Uh, we don't cook the crabs in the oven. Well, I want it oven baked. Sorry, ma'am, but the crab will burn if we put it in the oven. They're frozen, so we just put them in the microwave to heat it up. Karen. I don't mind if it's a bit crispy. I just want it oven baked. Okay? And put them together. Otherwise, it won't taste as good. She said this and finally sat down at her booth. 
Here's the thing. The crepe takes, like at most, a minute to heat up in the microwave, whilst the cookie dough takes like two to three minutes to cook. The crepe will be pitch black if it's put together with a cookie dough. At first, I thought of putting the crepe and cookie dough in separate plates and bowls to cook them at different times and then put them on the same plate once they're both cooked. So that's what I did. Cooked them both in the oven, placed them on the same plate, drizzled some milk and white chocolate, sprinkled some chocolate curls with ice cream and sent it out. Karen got the order and I saw her look at it with disgust. I didn't hear what she said because there's music blasting out loud. People are talking and kids are running about, but I can tell my coworker was having a hard time as Karen looked like she was yelling at her. My coworker came to the window and she looked upset. Coworker. Karen complained and said the cookie dough and crepe are clearly not cooked together. Since the cookie dough was cooked in a bowl, we had to scrape it out and pour it onto the crepe, so it was obvious. The owner, who saw what was going on, chimed in and had this really wicked grin. Owner. OP, go make it exactly the way she wants it. Since the orders have calmed down, I'll personally give the order to her. Me. Uh, sure. Okay then. So I did. Got a plate with the crepes, bashed on the cookie dough on top, and placed it in the oven for two and a half minutes, and voila. A pitch black crepe and well cooked cookie dough. The owner picked the plate up and handed it to her. Since the other front of house members finally came, I and the coworker watched from afar and watched the stunned face of an annoying jerk who seemed outraged she got her order exactly the way she wanted it. Again, we couldn't hear because of the noise, but we still enjoyed her stupid expressions as my boss was having none of her stupid nonsense. My boss is a firm but chill guy. He doesn't take crap from anyone, so he enjoys talking to people like her. So she marched out and began yelling, Karen. I'm never coming back here again to this stupid place, and left just like that. Me and coworker laughed like two hyenas, knowing that jerk got what she deserved. Am I the jerk for refusing to give my daughter her room back? I'm a father of two, Natalie, age 24, and Jonathan, age 17. Jonathan had mobility issues throughout his childhood, and it got worse as he grew up. He became a full-time wheelchair user two years ago after he had a serious accident that left him in a worse state than he was before. Natalie moved out for college at the age of 18 and then moved in with her now ex-boyfriend. Now I need to mention that because Natalie is my oldest and she had the bigger room in the house. Jonathan had the smaller room which was fine by him but now it's different. With the major changes in his life and needing a wheelchair to move around, I've considered to move him into Natalie's old room that she hasn't used in years. I first called her to let her know and she gave me the green light to go ahead and do what's best for her brother and make his life easier. I renovated it and added things in to accommodate Jonathan's needs and it cost money. Remember, that was almost two years ago. A few days ago, Natalie called saying she had a huge fight with her now ex after she caught him with someone and was staying at the hotel. We talked a little and she asked me to empty her bedroom and move Jonathan back to his old room because she wants hers back and said it would be cool if her mom and I prepare it for when she moves in with us. I was taken aback completely. I said, I can't move Jonathan out since he needs the room. I explained he needs the space to move freely, but she said it's her room, no matter how many years she has been away from home. I called her unreasonable and reminded her that she said I could give the room to Jonathan, but she said she wants it and expects to have it back now. We went back and forth on this issue and I refused to give it back to her. She threw a fit, saying I should be supporting her and giving her shelter in this hard time, and I replied, I know she's struggling and she's welcome to come, but the room was off limits. She got more upset, saying I was favoring Jonathan over her, and got my wife feeling guilty, saying she will be staying at the hotel until we tell her her room was ready for her, which I declined to do, and said she could stay there then. This morning, I found out my wife's been sending her money to pay for her hotel stay, and she's been telling the family I'm keeping her out of the house. In my defense, I told them Natalie wants the room, but Jonathan needs it, and I already spent money to renovate it. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Natalie? Please let us know. Hearing stories about entitled brats like Natalie makes me so glad that we never had any kids, Reddit boy. Am I the jerk for grounding my son after he decorated his room without his stepmother? I, 47 male, have two sons from my past marriage. Abel, who's 16, and Michael, who's 15. When I got remarried six years ago, Abel was very accepting and got on great with his new stepmom, Lori. 
Michael put up a fuss and was adamant about being with his mom full time. I fought like heck to keep him in my custody, but once he hit 13, the agreement changed anyways. He stays with his mom half the month and with us the other half. We moved last year and Lori and Abel have spent time decorating Abel's room and making it his own. Michael was offered the same thing recently. Lori offered to take him to Ikea, Best Buy and some other stores to find new furniture and have a day to put the room together. He said he'd think about it and she respected that but still showed him paint colors, beds and stuff to get excited about. Last weekend he came home with a pod full of furniture his mom bought him. I asked him about it and he said his mom helped him pick out the furniture and was coming around in a few to help him build it and arrange everything. I told Lori as a heads up and she was absolutely crushed. I took my son aside and told him the kind and fair thing to do would be to invite Lori to help. He said, nah, and told me he wanted to build with his mom. Unbeknownst to me, Lori did try to join them and asked if they needed help, and my son sent her away and locked the door so she wouldn't come back. After Lori told me this, I grounded him for the week and told him at least he'd enjoy the room his mom helped decorate. He of course left early to his mother's and told me he'd see me on our next rotation. Lori is saying I shouldn't have grounded him for spending time with his mom, and my ex-wife is saying if I keep treating him like this, I won't see Michael outside of holidays and birthdays. Edit for info. My son told me his mom was coming to help him decorate, and I did say yes, hoping he'd make it a stepmom and mom type of thing. I wasn't expecting him to completely exclude Lori. To those who must know why my marriage ended, my wife came out and realized she couldn't be with me and be her most authentic self. I do not harbor hate towards her, if that can explain why I don't hate my ex-wife and my current wife wasn't too upset to see her in the house. The marriage ended as amicable as possible until it came to custody. Karen Coworker Forces Me To Eat I, 24, male, am a small man, 5 foot 4 and 103 pounds as of my last physical. I'm well aware that I'm at an unhealthy weight. My entire life I've been small, mostly due to illnesses and myriad allergies, and it's admittedly a sore spot. I'm working with my doctor to gain weight while still fitting in with my dietary restrictions, no meat, dairy, gluten, or nuts. And honestly, I'm so much better than I was several months ago and proud of myself for the progress I've made. A coworker, Peg, 30, female, got pregnant and recently returned to work late November. She's been increasingly overt and uncomfortable in her concern for me. Peg made and brought in cupcakes for her return, and when I thanked her for thinking of us but refused, citing my gluten allergy, she was visibly upset. She didn't shout or complain much, just sighed heavily and said that she would put this one in the break room with the rest. I felt awful. Then she brought me a steak sandwich the next day on gluten-free bread. Again, I thanked her, but I had brought in my own lunch and needed to focus on that. Peg told me it was in the fridge for when I finished. Ended up bringing it home so she wouldn't feel bad and gave it to my boyfriend. Next day, she approached again. I refused again. She insisted. By now, we weren't alone in the break room. She joked that it was rude to refuse a home-cooked meal in favor of that, my lunch. At that point, I just took it and thanked her. Boyfriend ended up eating it. Then she just started leaving bagged snacks on my desk. She would approach with a snack or a portion of whatever she made for dinner the night before and not leave me be until I had taken it. I went to our boss and explained that I felt uncomfortable and was told that she was probably feeling maternal and it would negatively impact morale to discourage her. So, been taking notes since then. What days Peg has given what? When? Who witnessed it? Etc. From 12-8 to now, she's done it 23 times. Yesterday, I took Peg aside and explained that while I was touched, I would appreciate it if she wouldn't bring in anything else. She said that I should have said something sooner. She was only trying to help. Have I seen myself in a mirror? Does your boyfriend like you starving yourself? Among other phrases. Livid, I told her that maybe I didn't feel like sharing my personal medical history with her just so that my wishes were respected. For God's sake, we work with a hospital. Don't you know anything about HIPAA? We parted from there, me childishly storming off and her in tears. Have I already been a huge jerk? and would a report to HR just be the icing on the cake? I went to HR, saying that the matter was settled, but I wanted it documented. Subsequently, was told that there would be an investigation and the incidents would be corroborated with witnesses. 
Because, as is, the full record, I claim, is severe enough to warrant potential action for Peg and several other coworkers who also engaged in her behavior. HR started the process, apparently immediately, because I walked in yesterday to a crap storm. This plunged the department into war. Many agree Peg was out of line. Some told me I should have kept the status quo. Some said I was ungrateful and entitled. One said I should have handled this maturely, and who could blame her when I look like that? and I should be ashamed of myself. Another coworker suggested I work from home. Another told me he was sorry for not stepping in. I went to go get my lunch out of the fridge only to find someone had disposed of it and left behind the empty Tupperware. Nearly everyone has an opinion. The people in my corner have advised me to keep my head down and to take care. My boss held a meeting, first with Peg and me, then a second with just me. During the one with Peg, I was told to apologize for my part and Peg likewise. I'm sorry if I made you uncomfortable by caring about your health. My boss asked if I was satisfied now. I brought up Peg's comments and my boss said I invited them. No one would call that harassment and I need to work on myself. Together we went through each of the 23 events. She excused each of them until I was left to feel like I had been harassing Peg. The next meeting was even worse. Effectively boss said, I told you not to retaliate and instead you searched Peg out to harass her and your actions have expressed a worrying lack of cooperation with me and your team. She was also disappointed that instead of explaining that I needed her to resolve things, I escalated the situation well beyond the point of reason and cruel to someone who only wanted to help. She said I won't get far in life and I'm not likely to get anywhere vocationally if I can't be a team player and actively sabotage a happy workplace. She hoped I will learn from this teachable moment how to behave in a collaborative environment as it's inappropriate to involve HR for small misunderstandings. Boyfriend is mad. I'm just tired, confused, and hurt. HR seemed sympathetic. Boss is very clearly on Peg's side. The office is split and tense, currently updating my resume and job searching. It really does feel like a nightmare. Haven't felt good going into work for a while, and this just made it 10 times worse. My Karen ex tries to manipulate me into staying with her, ends up getting her feelings hurt. My ex and I got together over three years ago, moved into my house after a year. She has two kids from a previous relationship. We also have a kid together who's now almost a year old. We mutually decided to break up a few weeks ago. I have my reasons and she has hers, but ultimately her kids play a big role in the breakup. Not their fault, it's more about our different parenting styles. Due to their past, she has a protective bubble around them that was a massive source of conflict. I could write a list, but I don't see how it would be beneficial to this. Anyways, we broke up because we didn't want to resent each other for our kids' sake, like the way she resents her other kid's father. They've been staying here until she finds a new place. However, she keeps making remarks about how I'm going to struggle on my own, especially when I have my daughter half the time. I've let it go because I'm pretty sure she's just projecting. She will no doubt struggle. I was having a particularly bad day at work, and she knew and she brought up how I'm going to cope with work and our daughter. My life would be easier when they move out. Yes, I will be having my daughter three nights and four days a week. I changed my work pattern so when I do have her, I don't have to work. So I have no issues there. Looking after my daughter will be a breeze. I have no issues now looking after her. In fact, I make sure I have her more than her mother because I love spending time with her. And it will be even easier when her and her kids move out for so many reasons. The biggest is that all three cannot help themselves and always have to disturb my daughter when she's trying to sleep. So she then doesn't sleep and gets cranky and whines until I take her to her mother's so I can put her to sleep in peace. All three are extremely messy. My entire house is filthy and it stresses me out to no end and none of them clean up after themselves. I also find myself doing more for her kids than she does. I always take them to school and pick them up, take them to their after-school activities, make sure they are fed and shower often, as otherwise she wouldn't remember. I also pay for everything related to the house. We only split shopping and petrol. So I told her that when they move out, I will have more money to save because I will be spending less on bills and this is after me paying more than I should in child support. My house will be back to being clean and tidy. That will reduce my constant stress. Looking after my daughter will be less stressful because I will be able to put patterns in place to help. I will have more free time because I'm not spending it cleaning up their mess. 
running around all day for her kids when it is her job. My life will finally be back in my hands. She didn't take it too well and has been quiet ever since. Double Malicious Compliance I felt really bad about the first one, but definitely not the other. This was easily about 8 or 9 years ago. I was working in a call center. We sort of middleman between a selection of theme parks and hundreds of hotels that customers could book as a nice package holiday. Now, most people would call up the theme park, think they were talking to the location itself, but actually be talking with a bunch of part-timers in an office nowhere near. Depending which brand they called, we'd answer as that brand, and all in all, it was painless. There was a website, but we were there in case of special requirements. Sometimes people didn't want to book online, etc. Now, the parks we support are fairly popular. So much so, people do fly in specifically to have holidays there. This means the job was two things. Wonderful for some families, these were the once-in-a-lifetime trips, and you were the person helping them to get the holiday they wanted. The other side was pure heck. If the holiday went to crap, you know full well it's somehow our fault. We had all sorts of people calling, screaming, threatening us, etc. I had a good track record, often closing sizable packages and always went a little further, sorting out some balloons in the rooms for little Timmy's birthday, notifying the park to add Tom's birthday alongside the other kids to celebrate his special 45th. You know, random acts of kindness. I was often told by management to remember to stay in my lane, and while it was nice, I should be on the next call, not emailing the hotel to arrange the unpaid for bits and bobs. Now, one day a family called me and I could tell immediately they were posh. They were flying in and were looking for our top options, top hotel, unlimited fast track tickets, the whole lot. I went in immediately and suggested one of the on-site hotels, asking what favorite characters the kids going had, etc. However, the woman booking heard wonderful things about this alternative hotel. We're talking five star, Head chef won an award for cooking a pigeon so well, other pigeons would offer themselves to be next. All fine, sorted it all out. Booking came to $12,000. Threw my discount on there, pulled all the bells and whistles out. Boss comes over, raving. What a deal, what a close. I'll go tell my boss. Wonders off. Hours later, the family call back. Lady had since Googled the on-site hotel and was stunned at how wonderful it was. As it was for her granddaughter, could she be a pain and rebook there? Yes, absolutely. I have to cancel the old booking first. The refund can take the usual however many days, and the second booking made immediately. She says fine, went through, and read alert. Her American Express is stalled, as two $12,000 shots in a short space caused some issues. I checked our system and found out it was us blocking it, not her, and had to get a manager to resolve it. I explain I can't do anything right now to finalize it, but let me call in a favor. I call into the hotel and explain everything. Could they do me a favor and hold the rooms until we get it all sorted out? Yes. You want your usual balloons, BS? Their words. Yes. Go on then. I log everything in our system, all the conversations and who I spoke to. I go ask my manager and she's fuming because she's been bragging on how she's doing well because I closed this sale and suddenly asking her to refund the amount. Yeah, but it's to book it again. The second booking was actually more, and we'd end up still better off, but she wobbled about it. Tells me she will do it, but it's end of my shift, so I need to go home. I beg her to call the family, she said she would. Two days after my next shift, I sit down and see that my weekly total is missing the 12,000, but not replaced with the 15,000. I go ask my manager what's happened. Did she speak to them? No, they didn't answer. They'll call back. I asked if I could call them myself. No, get back on the phone. This is not your job. Your job is to answer the phones. I protested. This could be $15,000 we lose. We should chase it. None of your extra BS this time. Go get on the phones. I'm a little ticked off, but there's nothing I can do. So I decide the smart thing to do is log everything new in our system including what my manager told me, and just answer the phones. Two days pass and I get a phone call from the family asking for me to get patched over. They were ready to pay again. Amazing, let's do it. I call the hotel, sort out the package, and all ready to go. The red alert comes up again. My manager hadn't greenlit the payment. However, as the refund had been processed, it was just sat in pending. 
all my manager had to do was hit a button and the family would get the confirmation email. I spoke to my manager. She tells me to buzz off and to stop bothering her over this. I mark all that in the account on the system and promptly have a week off. I come back in. It's a Sunday night, slowest shift of the week. Usually, people phoning to tweak a booking, ask what time the park opens, etc. But then, one phone call came in to a newbie. The screamers are easier to deal with. They come in hot and you just play kind and calm. They look deranged and as all calls are recorded, if it needs escalating, you look sane. It's the calm, collected complaints which are the scariest. And this family's grandma? She's definitely done some crazy things. The poor newbie got this call and we knew immediately something was up. He nervously asked if I was on a call and if he could patch them over. Sure thing. It's the grandma and she's not happy. Calm, but not happy. They had flown in at the park's hotel, but as no payment had been received, they weren't allowed to check in. I checked the booking. My manager never processed. They were sat in the lobby, four kids, two sets of parents and grandma and nowhere to stay. I called my manager. It was 9 p.m. at night at that point, and she didn't answer. Tried three more times and got an email saying it's her night off, don't bother her. Another one logged in the system. I actually then called the hotel front desk, explained I was balloon BS and needed help. The staff there knew me and gave me a break, but they didn't have the power. The hotel manager did. Got patched to him, explained everything, and he went, okay, here's the deal. We can put the family in the rooms, but we need to charge someone the room. I'm going to charge the company you work for and you guys can hatch it out later. This is the first piece of malicious compliance I felt guilty about. I had done everything by the book and there was this family stuck stranded in the lobby and charging the company for the two was just a no-no. Like lose your job, have them come after you for the money type no-no. So I tried calling every contact I had, but it was 11 or 12 p.m. at night at this point and no one was answering. So I said forget it. I called the hotel back and told them to do it, knowing full well I'd be job hunting the next day. Logged it and left. Wasn't due in till 10 a.m., but got a call half past 7 telling me I needed to be there by 8. I arrive, get frog marched into the meeting room with three levels of bosses in front of me, my manager, her manager, and his manager. They also had a single printout with an invoice for $15,000 from the hotel in my name. They went in on me, 20 minutes of yelling, shouting, one left to get HR in for an immediate dismissal. HR arrived and only asked one question, can you justify why you comped a $15,000 package? The only thing I could think to say was, check the logs. My manager looked thunderstruck. Her boss looked perplexed and his boss just looked at my boss with a scowl and all three told me to wait there while they left and HR sat with me. Ten minutes later, I was told to take the day leave and when I came back the next day, my manager was on the phones like the rest of us and I was told I'd be reporting to her boss alongside the wider team. Learned two things. Do things nice and people do nice things for you. Also, log everything. Emails and conversations if you ever feel it wasn't right. Make a note and timestamp it for the love of God. Am I the jerk for buying a property where the house burned down, leaving a small mother-in-law suite, and not rebuilding the house? I was looking to buy a place, but I wanted something very small, since I'd be living alone and I don't want a lot to clean. I found something pretty unique, a lot which had had a house that burned down and was demolished, everything taken out so the land could be built on. But there was a garage still standing with a one-bedroom mother-in-law suite above it, just a bedroom, bathroom, and a little kitchen. This was surrounded by a half acre of mostly forest. I didn't know what to think at first till I went and toured it. I loved it. The three car garage would give me space to work on my car and bikes. The suite upstairs was bigger than any apartment I had and would be all my own to customize in a way I never could with an apartment. And the price was super low, unbelievably low for the area. I actually was able to pay a 50% down payment and I'll own it full on in five years. I checked with the local regulations and it would be legal for me to live in the mother-in-law suite on the property. Anyway, long story short, I closed on the house and moved in. I was really happy with the place. It was just the right amount of space for me, roomy without being a pain to clean. The outdoor space is great for my dogs and hosting barbecues with my friends. So on to the trouble. 
A couple neighbors made comments about being glad someone moved in to fix the place, which was an eyesore on their street. But a while later, my neighbors started asking when I'd start building, and I realized they thought I was living in the mother-in-law suite and planning on building a main house. I said I wasn't planning on it yet. I don't need a lot of space yet. My neighbors got upset I was bringing down the property value by leaving the lot a vacant lot and living in an old garage. Not mentioning that garage was new and a whole residence. I said I wasn't trying to bring it down. I'd keep it nice, but I didn't have house building kind of money. They said that just by keeping it as it was, I was bringing it down since its value was maybe one-sixth of the other home's values. I got frustrated and said I wasn't the one that burned the house down. Maybe blame whoever did that. I just got a place as is. The neighbors got upset with me, saying that because they had been close with the previous neighbors and the fire had been horrible. I said sorry, I didn't know, but honestly, they couldn't put their expectations on me after I'd bought a place not knowing any of that. I just bought a place wanting to get something I could afford. How could I expect to suddenly be expected to spend six times as much? The neighbors said that if I was buying a demolished building's land, there is an expectation that I rebuild. Am I the jerk for buying the land without plans of building? Evil Mama Bear is going to sell her house and move away. Well, it finally happened. Eventually, she'll be leaving for good. Evil Mama Bear recently made another post on Facebook telling everybody that she hates us all for ruining her life and that she wishes we'd all go to heck for it, but no longer cares because heck is too good for the likes of us. She's apparently going to sell her house so she can move back to her parents' old family property in Texas that they left her when they passed 20 years ago. She can't leave just yet though because things aren't settled with the courts over her attempt to attack future brother-in-law and their impending restraining order against evil mama bear. She's still having an enormous pity party online about how the family is supposed to have her back because blood is thicker than water. But they all just savaged her especially when she tried to blame this all on me again. It's basically come down to her saying that she wished I'd never been born because I'm a devil incarnate and the source of all of her problems. Apparently, I ruined her marriage, her job, her relationships with family, etc., and am the Judas that took her little princess away. That just got her laughed at, and I mean really laughed at. Even my sister thought it was funny. That made evil mama bear throw an online tantrum and said she hates us all and will be shutting her Facebook down soon because she can't take being mistreated by us any longer. That caused a huge backlash because they all called her out and started quoting things they remembered. So many relatives did this that Evil Mama Bear just didn't respond to them. My sister even joined in and told Evil Mama Bear on Facebook that all she's doing is projecting her own faults onto me because she doesn't want to deal with the consequences of her own actions. Apparently, Sis's therapist told her that. Then my sister went on to list numerous things that definitely were evil Mama Bear's fault, and that of course made my mother go into more denial. But she had no real answers on how said things were my fault. Then my sister asked her how it was that I'd go to heck and not her with all of the particular things she's done. Evil Mama Bear didn't respond for a few minutes, then just said we were all backing her into a corner to pick on her and she was going to go cry then she logged off. Her Facebook has been seemingly dead since then. Either way, there's pretty much nothing my mother can do to regain any semblance of her old reputation or what little of it there was to begin with since most people who knew her didn't like her at all. She was outed as a bad person, made a social pariah, arrested twice, and fired from her job. On top of that, all her neighbors hate her and have for decades, all because she's a narcissistic jerk. She has no friends and no family left to fall back on, so there isn't much left keeping her here anymore. The house my mother owns and currently lives in is a nice vintage one that's in great condition thanks to remodeling by my father when I was a little kid, so I doubt it will take very long for it to sell once it's listed. Meanwhile, my girlfriend, sister, future brother-in-law, and myself all went out to the same diner we unveiled the pregnancy DNA test results in and had a good dinner and some laughs got me a chicken fried steak. Since I've still got the restraining order up and cameras at my house, business, cars, and my sister's apartment, I doubt my mother will bother trying to pay either of us a visit again. At this point, she's already in enough trouble with the law, and I doubt she wants to do anything that'll risk her getting arrested again, 
because I know that's one of the few things she's really afraid of. But I'm going to keep my guard up. We are all well prepared with cameras. We go places in pairs. We have tasers, pepper spray, and phone tracer apps. And we've gotten the word out on Evil Mama Bear anywhere we could. A commenter suggested a while back that I should send my mother an anonymous package full of Limburger cheese. And I'm actually really tempted to do that once Evil Mama Bear has moved back to Texas since I still have the address of her parents' old property from my dad's list of contacts from back in the day. It would be one last nice bit of petty payback for all of the misery she put us through. Shame on a hotel for giving people with reservations a room. Shocker. If there were a contest of stupid crap I've gotten yelled at for, it's this one. My city has been hosting the playoffs and conferences for the past few weeks, so we've some pretty rough flips. I 100% do not blame housekeeping for dropping rooms to clean. Our sister property had it worse and was having to relocate reservations to a brand that only has queen beds. Unfortunately, this lady was chosen and she was not happy about receiving a queen. So my sister property's night audit checked in with me to see what my inventory was looking like, but all we had were double queens. She said she was waiting for No Queens McGee to call back to inform her that she did not have any luck with us. As the night goes on, this lady walks in, gives me her last name to check into her reservation. Me. I'm sorry, I don't have anyone by the last name McGee. When did you book the reservation? No Queens McGee. Um, I was supposed to have a reservation. She was supposed to make the reservation over here. That's what she told me. By then, I caught on to who was standing in front of me, and I inform her that the sister, N.A., was trying to reach out to her to let her know that we only had doubles. That's weird. I just called reservations. He said y'all had a king. Me. Well, it looked like there may have been a cancellation, but the king got booked up quickly. I have no other kings to offer you. She then starts going off how crappy we are, and that she called the hotel, and some man said we had kings. Meanwhile, I'm looking around, me trying to find this man she said she spoke to. Both her and I know she spoke with reservations. I apologized to her, but reminded her that because she did not have or make a reservation with us, the room type she was wanting was not guaranteed to her, regardless if she called to confirm that we have it. She then states she wants to speak to the manager. I said her problem with her original reservation is with insert sister company property here and you can speak with their manager, but since you did not have a reservation with us, we cannot help you. She did not like that response and demands I give her my name. I happily give her my first name, but of course, that's never enough for Karens, because they're seeking more than giving the information to my manager or corporate. I told her my last name is irrelevant. I'm the only OP here. You don't have a reservation with us. Have a good night. She walks away, yelling because she didn't like that I didn't give her my last name. It's okay, girl. My boyfriend don't want to give me his either. Only to come back five minutes later to snap a picture of me and leave. I hope she enjoys my, you're dead to me, face that I gave her. Should have asked her to send it to me. Anyway, I called security to kick her out as she was hanging around in the driveway and she was not a guest. Two can play the petty game. Am I the jerk for letting my husband deal alone with the environment he created in our home? This wasn't my first significant other with kids. I was prepared to not have any real authority with his two daughters. I've navigated the family dynamic as well as I can. My childhood was about absolute obedience and labor. His upbringing was progressive, but also neglectful. He lost his childhood to caretaking his grandfather with early onset Alzheimer's. It hasn't been rainbows. We both have psychiatric disorders. We cope, work on things, but after dozens of conversations about my PTSD triggers and mutual respect in the home, things have gotten steadily harder. Never more so than when his daughters came to live with us full time. He's very tidy and responsible, so it never occurred to me that when they came to live with us, they would not be given chores. None. When lockdown hit, I resigned my warehouse job. I was left with everything cooking, cleaning, meal planning. They would help me briefly when asked, expect praise, then immediately go back to their phones. Though we have enough money for food, I began skipping all of my personal favorites to avoid being treated like I was selfish for buying anything they don't like. He says he can't infringe on their childhood, 
but at the same time, he also can't make himself just appreciate what I get done without criticizing things like how I fold shirts. He'll wake me up hours before my alarm to be angry at me because the dishes aren't done or he can't find socks. I'm on edge all the time, just waiting for the criticism. It all came to a head. Our cats got fleas. We had to treat the house. Everyone was itchy and it sucked. But apparently, cleaning and getting the fleas was my pet project, not a household project. When his oldest daughter, 19, left four plus loads of dirty laundry from her closet floor, where her cat sleeps, in the dining room for a week while she was at her boyfriend's, I got blamed for it, for not finishing the cleaning I had started. That broke the camel's back. I slept on it. The next day, I talked with his mom, and then I had a talk with him. I'm staying with her for the next six to eight months to help her clean and prepare her home to sell it. I'm boxing my non-essentials, and if things don't get seriously better, I'm looking for an apartment. I've been living four blocks away for one week, He's having fits taking care of everything by himself. I'm scraping old paint, washing floorboards, clearing out mouse nests. He had three loads of laundry this week and dishes daily and is finally upset that his kid just doesn't do anything and insulted. And all I can say is, yeah, that's rough. Am I the jerk for quitting the home? That I would rather live in and clean an old broken down house that smells like mouse and doggy do than to keep cleaning up for my family? Is it just petty that if my husband doesn't have a moment of, oh, wow, she made life better, and apologize for shaming me looking at a box of frosting-free Pop-Tarts, I'm not going back? Auto Gratuity Nightmare Hi, first time posting here. To start off my story with some background info, my restaurant charges an 18% gratuity for tables of 6+. plus. We are also, for the most part, a small cafe, so most of our tables are made up of 1s and 2s. Oftentimes, when we get larger parties, we have to accommodate for them by pushing tables together, opening a certain back room for them to eat, assigning one server to them, etc. This is frustrating as is because it clogs up the wait list and takes away from the servers, but also because these people usually tip the least. Before the auto gratuity, I've gotten tips of less than $5 on $150 plus tabs or been stiffed. So now that the 18% is mandatory, it would keep us from getting stiffed, right? Wrong. One busy Saturday, we got a table of 10. Nothing too unusual, just people being rude and clogging up the wait list per usual. It was totally made up of old women. Right off the bat, it was a nightmare. Everyone wanted water and blank, and I had other tables at that point, so getting 20 drinks was extremely time-consuming and inconvenient. But no worries, stuff happens. Just do it, drop them off, and get their order. I drop off all of their food eventually and breathe a sigh of relief. It was a bit rough just dealing with such a big table, but it wasn't terrible. Finally, I got their boxes and one lady pulled me to the side. She asked for an apricot pie. Of course, I'd said. Then I bagged it up for her and brought it over. No, 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 she whispered harshly. It's her birthday. We want it served. This lady wanted me to sing happy birthday, cut up her pie, and serve it on 10 separately microwaved plates. Keep in mind, I was praying for this auto gratuity to come through because I had already been serving primarily them for an hour already and had not made any money. After their pie, I dropped off their check and the news was broken that every single lady wanted their check to be split. At this point, I was visibly annoyed trying to figure out who drank what and knowing I would have to make 10 different transactions. That's when the straw broke the camel's back. Every single woman had a coupon. It easily cut the bill by more than half and cut the gratuity with it. When it was all said and done, I'd spent two hours serving with a $10 gratuity to show for it. The women even complained about their tiny gratuity, which just tells me they didn't plan on leaving anything. Maybe I'm just spoiled, but time is money and I can easily make $30 to $40 in tips per hour on a Saturday. Moral of the story, some people suck. Am I the jerk for asking a couple to move out of my seats at the movies, even though it was their birthday? So this happened yesterday, and I still feel pretty bad about it, so I wanted to ask Reddit's opinion. I, 25 female, went with a friend to watch the new 007 movie at a pretty popular theater. We booked our seats in advance via online, and our seats were M10 and M11, towards the back in the middle. We got there 10 minutes before the movie started, and saw that there was a couple, in their 20s, a male and female, sitting in our seats. 
I asked if the seats they were sitting in were M10 and M11 and they might be sitting in our seats. The guy and the couple said this was N10 and N11. My friend and I were confused, so we asked the row in front of us to see what row that was. They said it was L. So if we go by the alphabet, and the row letter was also on the carpet, the couple were not sitting in their seats. I asked the couple again, nicely, that they might be sitting in the wrong seat, and the guy started to get really frustrated, saying that, These are just seats and that they even asked a worker here and mentioned that this was N10 and N11. This is where I might have been the jerk. My friend said, let's grab a random seat, but I went outside the theater and grabbed a worker and explained the situation. The worker came up to the row with me, but mentioned that there were still empty seats. I replied to him that people were still coming in, so I didn't want to take someone else's spot if the seats the couple were sitting in were actually our spots. The couple saw us bringing a worker in and the guy came up to us and started to talk bad about me in front of the worker and how I'm blowing it out of proportion and said crude things about me. The worker went out and got another person, I assume the manager, to verify the seats. At this point, the movie didn't start yet, but people that overheard us were also saying that these are just movie seats and that I should just sit somewhere else. Turns out the couple was wrong and those were our seats. The guy started to yell that he wanted a refund because the N10 and N11 seats are not in the middle. Any row after M only had seats on the left and right side, and empty in the middle for accessibility reasons. He said that I ruined his birthday, and I told him, okay, and told the worker to give us a seat that's not taken and we'll sit somewhere else, and he said no, it's too late, and I ruined his birthday night. He stormed off, and his girlfriend walked out and told me that I ruined the guy's birthday. The movie began shortly after, so we didn't cause a scene during. However, I feel bad for things to escalate so much, but I didn't know where else to sit, as it could have been reserved. Plus, it was his birthday. Should I have just let the couple have my seats? Am I the jerk? No, that guy's a psycho and I'm glad you ruined his birthday. Karen parks in my driveway without permission, gets her car towed. In my neighborhood, the homes have a garage, which has room for one vehicle, and a driveway with room for a second. I'm visually impaired, no sight, so I don't have a vehicle. A friend stopped by and thought I already had company because there was a vehicle in my driveway. Luckily, she had been jogging, otherwise she wouldn't have had anywhere to park since that vehicle was in my driveway and was blocking the garage. It was still there when she left. She wrote a note saying this is private property and to please move and not park there. The vehicle was parking there. Another friend put up a no parking sign. My next door neighbor saw the sign, said the vehicle belonged to Jane neighbor from across the street. I went over and asked Jane to not park there. Jane said her fiancé just moved in, and because Jane already had two vehicles, because one is hers for her work, she is apparently self-employed. They needed somewhere for the third vehicle, and I'm not using my driveway, so they're using it. I'll note here that Jane and her fiancé never asked if they could use my driveway. They just went ahead and used it. If I could see, I obviously would have noticed right away, but I had no idea. My next door neighbors on either side of me thought I was doing them a favor since Jane's been parking there for months. I also found out from them Jane's fiance parked in my driveway before she moved in when she visited. My job just recently went fully remote and my company has given up our office space completely. Before they sold our office space this summer, I still had to go into work. Jane's fiance works a different shift, so I don't know. I told Jane she didn't have permission and I sent her a registered letter too. She still parked there, so I got a tow truck to come. Jane got angry at me, and she said she will take me to court to get the fees back. A week after Jane's vehicle was towed, I fell going to my mailbox because there was a car in the driveway and I bumped into it. It was Jane's fiancé's personal car. She parked in my driveway because Jane didn't want her work vehicle to be towed again. Jane is saying she'll take me to court for the fees for this tow too. She also said it's my fault I fell because I didn't have my cane with me. I never use it on my own property and I'm overreacting because no one is using my driveway so they should be able to use it. The police came when I fell because an ambulance came and they told Jane and her fiancé to stop parking here. Apparently, they can't afford the fees so the towing company still has Jane's fiancé's car. Jane and her fiancé say I'm a horrible neighbor, etc., for not letting them use the driveway and causing them these headaches. I don't feel like I'm the jerk in this situation. 
but I can't drive, and I don't really understand the importance of having a vehicle. A few of my acquaintances have agreed with Jane and say I'm a massive jerk for calling the tow trucks. I like honest opinions from people with no stake in this. Jane and her fiancé are idiots, and so is anyone who sticks up for them. Ultimate Malicious Compliance at Work 3 for 1 Special Back at the beginning of 2021, I worked at a small community health nonprofit with an insane CEO. She would constantly call team meetings to put down and belittle employees in front of the entire staff. Often, she would throw around some variation of, Do I have to do everything around here? And call everyone on staff incompetent. When we did do something right, she never gave us credit and always took the credit for herself. She threatened firing everyone constantly and would randomly call us to gossip and make petty remarks about each other, putting staff against each other. One day, the CEO called a team meeting. In a group text chat between some of the more chill employees, we immediately begin sending snake and eye roll emojis. Sure enough, we get on the call and she begins by bringing to our attention how Luis does not dress appropriately for work. Luis, who is also upper management, the COO, looks about ready to smack the CEO. The CEO viciously tears into Luis, commenting on everything from her hairstyle to her lipstick shade to how it's inappropriate for Luis to wear off the shoulder blouses that show her collarbone. She then tells everyone that we all had better start dressing more formally or there would be consequences. The next day, the CEO calls another meeting. We all join and Luis turns on our camera. I immediately had to turn off mine because I didn't want to be caught laughing. Luis was dressed from head to toe in what looked like something someone would wear to a prom. Her hair was immaculately styled into an elaborate updo. Her makeup was professionally done with lash extensions and everything. She was dripping with what I assume were fake diamonds, tiara, earrings, necklace, bracelets, and rings, and she wore the most ridiculous navy blue satin gown with a faux fur shoulder shrug to cover her collarbone. My best guess is that it was an old bridesmaid dress, but she never did say where she got it. The CEO was immediately fuming. Why are you dressed like that? She screeched. You told us to dress more formally. This is formal wear. Is something wrong? That's not professional for work. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have been confused. You said we needed to dress formally, but I think what you meant to say was professionally. The CEO was livid but Luis continued to rock the prom outfit all day, meeting with patients and clients and everything. Later that week, Tina texts our group chat and says the CEO is requiring her to submit a detailed timesheet with what she was doing and working on down to the minute for her entire day. She was going to BCC us on the email. Sure enough, it pops into our inboxes a few minutes later. Tina had literally detailed her entire past 24-hour day down to the minute. 6.45 a.m. Awoken by husband's flatulence. 7 a.m. Went to the bathroom. 7.12. Turned on the shower. 7.13. Tested water temperature with hand. You get the idea. Apparently, the CEO called her on her cell phone and berated her for sending such a detailed timesheet. Tina reminded her that she had requested her entire day down to the minute and didn't specify she meant her work day only. Finally, my turn. My job was in IT, and most of my work was as a database administrator, but I often helped with other tech problems. One morning, the CEO called me repeatedly at 2 a.m. My phone settings have it so that if I miss five calls in a row from the same person, the do not disturb mode is turned off and the phone rings. I see who it is, silence my phone, and refuse to answer. At 6 a.m., she calls again. Again, I refuse to answer. 7 a.m. Refuse to answer. 8 a.m. Refuse to answer. Finally, at 9 a.m., I call her back. She asks to hop on a video call. I've been trying to get a hold of you all morning. Where have you been? <sighs> Can I help you with something? I asked, not even trying to hide my irritation. I literally rubbed my temples and slurped on my coffee loudly. You didn't answer my question. And I'm not going to. I was off the clock at the time you called. You're salaried, right? That means it doesn't matter if you work 100 hours or one hour. You get paid the same. So I expect you to be available when I need you. What do you need? I need you to reset all of our company usernames and passwords. We're letting someone go today, and it's company policy to change all of that. 
At the same time, Louise texts me saying she's being let go. So I read the company handbook and make a copy of the page that says the IT person must update the usernames and passwords and give the information to the COO. I changed all of the usernames and passwords to everything, from social media accounts to bank accounts to QuickBooks and emails. I send the usernames and passwords in an encrypted email to Luis and then send the CEO my two-week notice. Two weeks go by. It's the last hour of my last day. So what do I do? Change all those usernames and passwords again and send them to Luis, who is also celebrating her last day. I log out of my email, put my company phone and laptop in the mail, and spend the evening cackling at my malicious compliance. The very next day, on Saturday, the CEO calls me repeatedly. Finally, she leaves me a long and howling voicemail to say what I did was unprofessional and she would make sure my reputation suffered and I would never work in that industry again. I wait until Monday to call her back. Hey CEO, I saw you called. I need the usernames and passwords to everything. I'm sorry, but I don't work there anymore. You will have to contact your IT person to help you with that. You are the IT person. No, I was the IT person. Now I'm a private consultant and I would be happy to provide my services at a rate of $100 an hour. You changed all the usernames and passwords and didn't provide them to me. Correct. Per company policy, when an employee leaves the organization, the IT person is supposed to update everything and send the new info to the COO. I was leaving, so I updated everything. I provided all the usernames and passwords to Louise. You knew she was quitting too. Why would you give them to her? Because the company policy says to transfer the new username and passwords to the COO, not the CEO. Luis was the COO when I left. Caught in her own bureaucracy, she then had to spend weeks trying to gain access to all of the company accounts. On Luis and my last day, Tina and another employee quit. Another person announced her retirement. Once the five of us were gone, we were followed by several other employees. In total, 11 people on the 14-person staff quit within a few weeks. The best part? I got a new job making the same amount I did at the crappy nonprofit, but part-time in a government position and with full-time benefits. So much for my reputation suffering. I stayed in touch with one of the employees who stayed behind. She's only three years away from retirement and is basically Stan from the office. She said they've hired at least a dozen people. All of them quit as soon as they could find another job. Anyway. I'm bored in the hospital and started going through old texts, stumbled on our old group chat and had a good chuckle. Thought you all might find it humorous too. Names obviously changed. Entitled cousin insults my mom for having me young, then proceeds to have a baby young as well. So I'm from Southeast Tennessee and teen pregnancies are common. My cousin's friend, B, had a baby at 17. I don't know if the dad is still around, but B's parents are supportive and helped her. As far as I know, B has a job and loves her kids. Although she's definitely young and the circumstances are not the greatest, I'd consider her a good mother to the current toddler and her newborn. Backtracking a little bit, my mother also had me young, at 20, and she had to drop out of college for me. My father stuck around and has been a wonderful dad. Both of them did good for me, albeit there were some crazy moments. Q two years ago, my cousin went on a random, massive rant about useless teen mothers. Now, I don't think teen pregnancy is a great thing and many teen parents are very irresponsible, but the tone and writing of the post just seemed so unnecessarily mean. Plus, the post was directed at B specifically, who was now pregnant with her second baby. Again, I'm unsure of the status of the father, but everything seemed fine. She was 19, I think. My mother is a very confrontational woman and she always thought B was super sweet. I did too, so I was surprised when my mother showed me it. I don't have Facebook, so I couldn't interact with the post. My mother reminded my 19-year-old cousin that not all young mothers were useless, etc., and circumstances sometimes are just bad, even with good planning. My mother helped raise my cousin, who then called my mother very mean names. She blocked my mother. Fast forward to 2020. Cousin is pregnant at 21 and with a crappy man. Tables have turned. She is now lashing out like crazy. She's demanding new Instagrammable baby clothes. They need to be blue, yada yada, crazy entitled stuff. She's complaining about her sacrifices and it's just a non-stop pity party. I ignore it and I really want to remind her of what she said, but I don't. My aunts were reminding her how fast babies grow 
so new and expensive clothes aren't necessary. I was raised in mostly purples, so the cousin could ask my mother. Purple wasn't good enough. It was kind of shocking, but also not that she was being like this. Baby is born on a particular date in November of 2020, which, sad enough, was my birthday as well. It's no one's fault here, but this just unreasonably upsets me. Again, no one's fault. Not the baby, not the jerk cousins, but God that makes me angry that the woman who insulted my mother over the topic of babies had her baby naturally on my birthday. Cousin will not stop demanding free babysitting for my grandmother, who has been on my mother's side the whole time. Cousin wants to go back to her old life, so my uncle straight up tells her adoption. She refuses because the baby is so cute. Apparently, she also kicked the dad out for being lazy. I genuinely don't know any more about this train wreck beyond that. She seemed happy on Instagram in her latest post, and I moved to New York lately for college, so everything I hear beyond Instagram is from my mother and grandmother, but I seriously doubt that's the whole current story. Am I the jerk for buying myself a new phone instead of getting my husband one? For some context, my husband and I have mostly separate finances. I'm the primary earner and I cover 85% of our rent and expenses. This is because half his income goes to child support and I want him to still have money for himself. I'm the kind of person who takes care of their electronics. I can keep a phone for two to four years with very little issue. Towards the end, it might be scratched up a bit and have a wonky charge port, but in general, still fully functional. Every single phone I've ever had, save one, has been replaced only when I felt ready for an upgrade, not because the previous one broke. My husband, on the other hand, somehow manages to destroy all of his phones within one to two years of purchase, closer to one than two. In the last five years, I have bought him three phones, not high-end, Moto G series mostly, because I use the same ones and they work well and in my opinion, hold up well. Every time he gets a new phone, I make sure he has a screen protector and a case and all that good stuff, but he'll take the case off for some reason or it'll break. The last one had these tabs that clipped a hard shell over a rubber shell and the tab snapped off and he won't replace it. Then he drops it and the screen protector cracks and is compromised, but he doesn't replace the screen protector either. So from there, he ends up cracking the screen and over the course of a couple months, the screen gets worse and worse until it's unusable. His current phone is facing imminent death. The screen is half destroyed. Part of it won't light. The charge port is barely working. It's a mess. I've been thinking about replacing my phone for a while now, but I was on the fence about it because my phone still works okay. There's a hairline crack in one corner and the charge port needs to be supported when it's plugged in, but neither is really affecting its function. I have the extra money right now for one phone, so I'm deciding to buy myself a new phone as an upgrade and give him my old one until he can save up and research and buy himself a new one. To be honest, I'm tired of replacing things he's destroyed only for him to destroy them again a year later. At least this way he has a working phone in the interim. I was talking to a friend about this plan and they said I was being unfair and selfish, that if my phone works, I should be replacing his first instead of worrying about replacing mine. Now I'm second guessing myself. Am I the jerk? Edit. I wanted to add this because it came out when I was writing a comment and I think it's important to why I'm asking about whether or not I'm the jerk. My husband isn't the kind of guy who speaks up if something bothers him. He won't come in saying, this isn't fair, or make a stink about it. So I get anxious that I'll inadvertently be unfair or rude or hurtful and then he'll suffer it without telling me. So when someone outside of our relationship says, that's messed up, I want to take it into consideration because it's possible that it is messed up and my husband is too much of a teddy bear to tell me. No folding napkins? Well, okay then. This was a few years ago, back when I was working at a mid to high end restaurant in a touristy New England town. I started as a busser and that's where this story takes place. First, our cast. We've got yours truly, a floor busser. Other floor bussers, three of them for a total of four. Back bus, the one busser to rule them all. He's stuck in the back room running dishes, polishing silverware, taking out the trash and a bunch of other stuff. Bob, our lunch manager, not his actual name, our scene. The restaurant has two floors, with two floor bussers per floor. When bussers arrive, our job used to be folding napkins for use in the service ahead. As one would expect when you put a bunch of high schoolers and one outlying college student, hi, together, folding napkins was not a priority 
but catching up on gossip was. On a normal morning, I folded a majority of the napkins used during lunch simply because I was faster and could talk while doing so. Meanwhile, the back bus had to set up all the bus stations before he could join the rest of us, and the wait staff set up everything else. One day, Bob decides the floor bussers are not doing enough to help get the restaurant ready for the service. His plan to fix this? Bussers were no longer allowed to fold napkins. Instead, we had new set-up chores. At first, we bussers tried to strike a balance by having two floor bussers do the new chores and two doing the folding. But nope, all bussers had to do the new chores. There would be no more folding of the napkins unless chores were done. If they weren't done, oh well. From now on, folding napkins was added to the back bus's list of duties. I also worked nights, so I didn't find this bit out until my next lunch shift. I want to give a shout out to the back bus of this story for actually agreeing to go along with this. The dude was a champ and still is. Third, the malicious compliance. We didn't fold napkins. We performed our new chores. Meanwhile, the back bus did all of his normal setup chores and then furiously folded napkins. However, as expected, we ran out about two-thirds of the way through the shift. Servers started folding napkins just to reset tables and they complained to Bob because they were doing our job. God forbid the waiters had to bus a table. Bob demanded to know why there weren't any napkins. Why isn't back bus folding them? Turns out he was doing one of the dozen other more pressing tasks, like running dishes or taking out the trash. Annoyed that back bus is doing his actual job, Bob ordered one of the floor bussers to go full napkins. We managed to get through the shift and the dinner shift starts coming in. The dinner bussers get to folding and are confused as to why there are no napkins. We tell them that lunch bussers are no longer allowed to fold napkins. I had a few dinner shifts. Meanwhile, the same thing plays out during the lunch shifts. Floor bussers do their new chores. Back bus can't do it all and they run out of napkins in the middle of a rush. Bob doesn't understand why one busser can't fold the same amount of napkins as four bussers, so he comes up with a new plan to fix this. The dinner shift bussers now have to fold enough napkins for the lunch shift, or at least enough for lunch to start. To which the dinner shift bussers say, oh heck no. Bob tried to throw his weight around, but since he wasn't a dinner manager, dinner bussers were technically out of his jurisdiction. Plus, they could fold all the napkins in the building, but there was no guarantee there would be any left over for the lunch shift, let alone get through dinner during the high season. The dinner bussers told the dinner managers what was going on, one of whom was the general manager, and management told Bob to knock it off. Bob adjusted his policy so that two bussers could fold napkins in the morning, and the other two did all the other chores. We still ran out of napkins on occasion, but it usually wasn't because enough weren't prepared before service started. Am I the jerk for writing a negative review of a restaurant that refused to deliver to us? So my husband and I, both mid to late 20s, moved house. The first night we were there, we ordered takeout from a place we saw on the journey. They took our order, asked for our address and all that, but we never got our order. We called multiple times, but they wouldn't answer. We called their second customer service number and were told to visit in person for a refund. We did. We found out that the previous owner of the house had been deny listed and that the company didn't know about the new owners. We said no worries and asked to be taken off the deny list. They said no and said that there's no real way to know that we're not working for the guy so they won't be serving us. I'm annoyed at this point but don't want to start a real fuss so I went online and wrote a review. I gave one star and wrote about how they took the order but didn't deliver and that they won't take our address off of the list because of the previous owner, who we have no connection to. Later that same night, we had family over and we told them about what had happened. They said we were wrong to write a review like that and that it could hurt business. They said we should go to a different place instead. We have been, but now I'm wondering if I was wrong for writing that review. I also received a snarky comment from the company under my review. Am I the jerk? Edit. My review. One star. My boyfriend and I ordered and paid for food from them, only for said food to never arrive. We weren't given any delay warning and only found out what to do after we called the delivery number. We're told to come in in person to get a refund. Whilst there, we were told that our address is deny listed due to the previous owner. They're refusing to deliver to our address. I can't speak on the food as we aren't allowed to eat it, but the customer service was awful and the attitude of the workers even worse. Their reply, 
Hi, Sugar Spice. Thank you for your review. Unfortunately, being rude to our staff is never an effective way to get customer service. We refunded you, but you still insisted on being an exception to our deny list rule. As per your behavior towards my staff, you are now denied listed on your own merits. Thumbs up emojis. I should note that I was not rude or snarky to the workers. I've worked at a restaurant and have dealt with jerks. I was calm, collected, and understanding the entire time. The worst behavior was when I said, oh crap, for real? When they said they weren't delivering to our address. Am I the jerk for telling my niece and nephew stepmom her kids are not my problem? My sister passed six years ago. She was married to James and had Luca, now 14, male. Megan, now 12, female. And Dante, now 11, male. After my sister passed, James turned on me and my family. I don't think James liked my sister much in the last few years of their marriage. I had that vibe for a couple of years before she passed, but especially after. He was just so callous, and he told me he was free from her at last, that she should have known he didn't want to be with her anymore and really set him free. I think he never left because of the kids. He said he could find real love. He could find someone better, just talks trash about my sister and it's disgusting. He met his wife 13 months after my sister passed and they got married 4 years ago. She has a 7 year old son and 2 kids with James. We're not a big blended family. My parents and I see my nephews and niece with visitation granted by the courts after he tried to cut us off, but that's where it ends. We see them one weekend a month and for a certain amount of time at Christmas and near their birthdays. Their stepmother has complained before about us not including her kids with my nephews and niece. Her biggest problem is we have a special birthday cake we make in our family and we make it for each member of the family every year. Every member gets it. The kids have helped us bake it too. She knows about this. She has seen photos. She wants us to make it for her kids and to include them in the tradition. My parents and siblings have said no. So have I. One day she called me using Luca's phone and told me as the mother of my nephews and niece I should share with her kids. I told her she's their stepmother and her kids are not my problem. I want to add here that the kids are aware now of how much their dad resented their mom. It's made their relationship tricky. It has also made their relationship with their stepmother pretty bad too. They see how badly they want their mom to cease to exist even in their memories. I know Luca has mentioned that his stepbrother does seem to know more about what happens when he and his siblings are with our family and he said he does feel left out. He thinks his dad and stepmother are talking about it around the other kids. He told me he kind of feels bad but he also doesn't want them intruding on the family. He said his stepmother would only use her kids as a spy. Megan said her step and half siblings don't belong in our family and her stepmother proves that when she acts the way she does. Am I the jerk? You can't quit, I want you fired. The morning after a good rowdy kickback in our apartment, my roommate and I go to the orange hardware store after noticing some holes in the walls. Roommate goes to find plaster and I go to find the paint. I get to the paint department and I'm looking through the paint swatches to remember what our walls look like. Keep in mind, still very hungover. I pick out a color that's probably the closest and if not, then I'll just mix my own paint, Art Miner. There's no employee at the paint mixing station, so I just put the swatch in my hoodie. To pass the time, I sort the paint swatches properly because mild OCD. Then it comes. Ahem. Here's the cast. Not real names. Employee is George. Manager is Jason. We've got me, and we've got the rude Karen. Karen. I need you to do your darn job and mix me some paint. Me. Stares blankly as hangover is blocking my ability to respond. Karen. Hello, I'm talking to you. Mix my paint. Fortunately, my brain finally decides to turn on again. Me. I don't work here. Gets cut off by Karen. Don't you lie to me. I saw you sorting the color wall poorly. Only a lazy employee would do that sort of thing. Me. Ma'am, I'm gonna be honest. I'm really hungover, and your screeching is making me want to puke. That statement went as well as you would expect. You're a terrible worker. And a terrible person for saying that. I'm going to get your manager and have you fired. Storms off stage left. Once the banshee left, I hear chuckling from down the aisle behind me. Lo and behold, my roommate listened to most of it and is laughing his butt off. He asked if I got the paint and I explained the first part of the confrontation. 
we decided to wait for the manager because maybe he'll mix our paint before we are kicked out. We wait a few more minutes and George walks up, oblivious to what just transpired and starts mixing our paint. Enter stage left, Karen with a very annoyed manager on her heels. Karen, that's the one that called me an orangutan jerk and he needs to be fired right now, pointing at me. Jason, George, I'm frankly surprised you'd say such a nasty thing. George, uh, what now? Karen, not him, the scrawny one in a hoodie. He even told me he is drunk. Jason looks at me and looks confused. Ma'am, he doesn't work here, but I can ask him to leave for insulting you. Karen, no, he definitely works here. I saw him working. Me, okay then, I quit. Karen, you can't quit. I want you fired. By now, our paint is done mixing, and I ask George if he'd like to escort us to the front. I've never seen a morning shift employee brighten up so fast. Karen is belligerent, and the manager tries to calm her down with coupons. My roommate, George, and I leave paint as fast as possible and can still hear the screeching from the cashier's stand. We pay, and George walks us to the car. I explain what really happened, and he laughs and says he'll tell Jason the situation. Initially, my roommate and I were gonna go straight home, but we had to see the outcome of this, so George agreed he'd come back out once the orangutan jerk was gone. The police ended up having to be called just to escort her out, but she was not arrested. Jason and George came out to the car, and as George had already explained what happened, Jason profusely apologized. We laughed it off, and I said something along the lines of, it was worth getting out of bed for despite the hangover. Jason gave us free membership perks, and the next time we came in, we were so kindly informed that Karen had come back later that day and vandalized some of the yard equipment always on display, and she was arrested. Serves the orangutan jerk right. My pregnant wife expected me to drive two hours to get her ice cream at 3 a.m., then cried to her daddy about it when I refused. I'm 30, male. My wife is 29, female. Yesterday night, my wife at 3 a.m. woke me up and said, Babe, I want something to eat. I wake up and say, Hmm, okay, what do you want to eat? She says, I want some ice cream. I said, okay, I'll get you some from downstairs. Which one do you want? We have the vanilla or the chocolate. She said, I don't want none of those. I want this Breyers Reese ice cream. I want that one. Get me that. I said, but babe, we don't have any of those. She then says, well... Get me some, please. I'm your wife. Come on. You know I got a baby in my stomach. You're feeding two people. Keep in mind, we live in a rural area with a small population. Convenience stores and grocery stores don't open until 6 a.m. where we live. None of them do. The only thing that is open is Circle K, which is at least almost two hours from where we live that's in the city nearby. We live in a rural area, so driving two hours just to get ice cream doesn't make sense. I thought about looking into ordering that ice cream on GoPuff or Uber Eats and I checked on my phone that none of them were available in our zip code. So then I told my wife, well babe, I guess you gotta wait. Sorry, I can get you some when it turns six, but there's still three hours left. I mean, we still have chocolate and vanilla ice cream at home you can eat. You can eat that and when it turns six, I'll drive over and get you the other one. It's not a problem. Then my wife just makes a grunt noise and says, fine. Turns out, my wife texted her dad about it, and he called me up and asked me why I didn't get his baby girl the food she wanted. I told him that we live in a rural area, and stores don't open until 6. We don't have any delivery options nearby, and I can get it for her at 6, but not now. He told me I was being a bad father for not helping my pregnant wife. Am I the jerk? Edit. Also, I want to hear your thoughts and what you'd do. Would you get your significant other their craving in the situation? I'm genuinely curious to hear others' thoughts on what they would do in my place. Would you go or not? Edit 2. A lot of you are saying I should have mixed peanut butter in a blender with ice cream or gave her ice cream with peanut butter. We don't have any peanut butter at home, so that wasn't an option really. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his wife? Please let us know. If I tried this on Reddit boy, I'd be sleeping in the backyard. Am I the jerk for not believing my daughter's obvious lie and canceling our weekend? Last week, I went to use my Bluetooth headphones. They were gone out of my bag where they always are. I asked my daughter if she had them. She's always taking my stuff without asking. I've told her all she has to do is ask whenever she needs to borrow my stuff. That's all I ask in return. 
because I know I won't get it back as she'll deny it. She said no. I was skeptical. She guilt tripped me saying I'd never believe her, etc. Which she's not wrong. I don't as she has a history of lying. She's constantly lying to me. Even small, insignificant things. It's frustrating. I felt awful and apologized. Just assumed I'd left them in the car or somewhere else. I wanted to believe her. Anyway, yesterday I was in her room looking for something I know she had borrowed, which I needed back. I didn't go through her stuff or anything of the sort. I respect her privacy. Noticed her makeup bag on the floor and had a look in there for my moisturizer. And there are my headphones. I was not happy. Decided I'd wait to talk to her when I picked her up from her course. When she gets in the car, I tell her I found them and ask why she had lied. She keeps saying she doesn't know how they got there, etc. I ask to see her Bluetooth pairings on her phone as if it's not paired, I'd believe her. She wouldn't. We argued about it for at least 10 minutes. She kept up the argument that I wouldn't believe her either way, which I told her, no, that's not true. She just refused to show me. She wouldn't budge. She ended up crying and I could tell she was very, very stressed. I kept asking to see the pairings that if she hadn't used them, they wouldn't be in her phone. She ended up getting out of the car and walking off. I watched her and unsurprisingly, she got on her phone straight away. I gave her a couple minutes for myself and her to calm down, then asked her to get back in the car. I asked again to please just show me her pairings. I wasn't surprised when she showed me straight away. I knew she had deleted it when she got out. It was just so obvious to me. I said to her, you flat out refused to show me before you had a chance to delete it. You were in obvious distress about showing me, but as soon as you had the chance to delete it and get back in the car, you show me straight away. I wasn't born yesterday. But now I'm the jerk because I said I'd believe her and now I don't. I'm at my wit's end with her constant lies and deceitful tendencies. I want to believe her. I truly do. It just doesn't make sense for her to not know about them being in her makeup bag when she had makeup on when I picked her up. I'm meant to be taking her and her friend away for a trip this weekend to hot pools and a bungee jump. I want to cancel it if she doesn't own up to the truth. Am I the jerk? Edit for info. She's almost 18. I started to recognize this behavior as an issue from around the age of 5. She's been in and out of therapy from the age of 13 or 14, always stops and refuses to go back after several sessions due to thinking the therapist is a jerk. Her words from her most recent one. Even though she likes it at first and is open with chatting to me about it again at first. She's had no major trauma that I know of apart from me and her dad splitting when she was three. She was week on slash week off with us co-parenting together. Anyway, little update. She rang me. I completely avoided the subject of asking for her honesty entirely and went straight to asking her if she'd be open to trying therapy again. She lost it on me. Started saying very hurtful things. Even said she'll be spending Christmas at her dad's. No idea where that came from. I let her finish and asked what time she will be home as we need to sit down and have a chat. I told her I won't be angry, we just need to talk. She's not coming home tonight apparently. I didn't get a chance to let her know I will be canceling the weekend as she hung up on me after telling me she wasn't coming home. Thank you to everyone that's taken the time to comment, not the jerk, or you're the jerk, etc. It's all helped. I've tried to keep up, but there's so many. I will do my best to answer. Think of what the customer wants? Sure. I work at a print hub, working the printers and adjusting files and such. I put in a lot of work to deliver a perfect product, despite the issues that plague the shop, and always ensure that everything I produce is quality checked. This isn't due to me putting pride in my work, however, but rather my boss nitpicks nearly everything. If something is off-center by a millimeter, it's redone. If there's a small scratch on one poster in a pack of five, the whole order is redone. Now, don't get me wrong. The boss is a good person, not a Karen or anything, but sometimes we have to redo orders several times to ensure it's done to her expectations, which is absolutely fair. She is the boss, and it's not too often she does this. Anyways, on to the incident. I just learned that I'm supposed to run a one-shot D&D session this weekend. Short notice, half maps and everything is set up. It's a long story why this is last minute, but doesn't pertain to the story. As a result, I quickly picked out one of the dungeons I ran in my regular Dungeons & Dragons group, a galleon ship trapped in time where the players need to manipulate the environment to have one crew open or close doors and turned it into a one-shot adventure. I call it the time between the seconds. Since it was last minute, 
I didn't really have time to optimize maps, so I just sent the order through my job's online submission, with the intention to just print out a pixelated mess just for the sake of having visuals. It's the way I DM. I like having visuals for my players to help them envision the area. Today when I came in, I found the order I submitted and completed it quickly. Admittedly, it was a bit of a mess, and it didn't help that our color machine started leaking toner again. Blue streaks on the paper and everything. Whatever, I'm fine with it. An hour later, while I was working with posters, my manager, let's call her Kay, came into the room. She started. Kay, holding up my order. What is this? Me. Oh, that's my job. I was... Kay interrupts. How can you say this is good? It's pixelated, and the machine dumped toner on it. Me. Kay, it's okay. I am... Kay interrupts me again. It's not okay. You have to contact the customer and figure out how they want to proceed. Me, sarcastically. Trust me, I'm sure the customer won't mind. Look at the customer name. K. It doesn't matter. I want you to see how they want to proceed. Think about what they want. Me. Ah, <sighs> yes, K. K dropped the order in front of me and left the room. I considered my options for a moment and looked towards my dwindling workload. Oh well, malicious compliance number one. I finished my assigned work and got to work on the maps. As I said, I didn't properly optimize them or anything, so I started working through the 5 11 by 17 maps I had smoothing out the pixels. It took about an hour to get everything set up. Normally I work on a program other than Photoshop for my maps. After that, I went through the character sheets, filling in any of the blanks I left in, such as personality, bonds, and gold. About 15 minutes. Then, what about any random gear they may have? A big part of this one shot is their carrying weight, so I calculate those totals up. Another 20 minutes. About an hour and a half later, I have the files up to the customer standards, which is mine, and I print them out again. But the toner dumping on the color printer is still an issue, so even though the files looked a lot better, there would still be blue streaks on the paper. So when K saw it, K holding the completed order. Cole, what are you doing? You know the color machine is down. Me. I know, but I can't wait for the machine to be fixed. K considers for a moment before speaking. Call the customer and explain the issue. See if they will accept it half off. Me. That isn't needed, because just do it. Me, taking a deep breath. Ah, <sighs> Stay here, please. Malicious compliance number two. I picked up the office phone, looked her dead in the eyes, and dialed the number on the order form. From my pocket, the silver samurai theme from Phoenix Wright series began to chime. I take my phone out of my pocket and answer, immediately saying, yes, I will take half off my order. Kay was speechless and just quietly walked out the door. To her credit, she did honor the half off she offered the customer, but perhaps next time she will actually let me finish what I'm trying to say instead of constantly cutting me off. Don't get me wrong, Kay is a good person, but today was a harsh day on everyone since our machines are having issues. The only one who was able to get anything done was me, since my printers, the wide format and the drafting machines were working perfectly. I'm sure tomorrow we will have a laugh over the situation as the machines are fixed now and stress levels have lowered. Am I the jerk for sending back my dish four times because it wasn't spicy enough? I'm currently on a business trip in another city. A few days ago, I dined in at a Thai restaurant near my hotel. I ordered a green curry and asked for five-star spiciness. My waitress laughed at me and told me that I'm getting it three-star. I corrected her and told her that I in fact ordered it five-star. When she came back with my dish and I tasted it, it was not spicy at all. It wasn't even a three-star. I sent the dish back and it came back a few moments later with what appeared to be red chili flakes sprinkled on top. I asked her about it and was sarcastically told that I ordered it spicy. I told her that it makes no sense to sprinkle red chili flakes on a green curry which is supposed to be made with green chilies. It honestly looked hideous, but I tried it anyway. It still wasn't spicy, so I sent it back. When I got my dish the third time, it was exactly the same as the first one I got. So I sent it back again, only to have the red chili flakes sprinkled on top again. It was, like that other time, not spicy, so I sent it back for a fourth time. When I got my dish for the fifth time, I was happy to see that there were no red chili flakes sprinkled on top. 
The waitress, in a very sarcastic tone, told me that they made it extra spicy just for me. Told me that she was going to stand there and watch me eat it, and took away my water glass. I tried it, and it was not extra spicy, but it was just barely acceptable, so I didn't send it back. I told her so, and she walked away, looking completely bewildered as I finished my bland meal. The next day, I was still upset about it, so that night, I decided to order the same dish from the same restaurant to my hotel room, but under a Thai name, just to see if they made it any differently. Sure enough, the food was very spicy, just as I ordered. It was far better than the extra spicy dish I had at the restaurant. I sent the manager an email detailing my experience at the restaurant along with the waitress's rude behavior. I told them about the difference between my meal from that day and my delivery order. The manager apologized and told me that they will talk to the waitress in question. They also offered to refund both of my meals, but I declined because I will be reimbursed by my company and do not plan on eating there again. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. I don't even think about what else they did to your food. Back when I worked at Jack in the Box, we used to don't clock out late, no problem. I worked for a hotel chain restaurant as a busboy and had lots of other little side jobs besides working the floor, mostly helping to move stock off of pallets and stuff like that. Sometimes I would clock out a little late if shipments came in later or if it was a busy day, plus a large shipment always guaranteed another hour on the clock. We got a new manager who looked at my time card during her first fortnight as the new manager. She was really aggressive with me, asking me why I clocked out so late, like, so, what's up? You're playing video games on the clock for an hour? Hmm? You just hanging out getting paid? The rec room had video games. I explained that I was unloading pallets, and she said, You're a bus boy. That's not your job. You clock out at nine. We have a payroll to make, and we can't do it with people working extra hours because they didn't work hard enough during their shift. Okay, fine. Finally, about a month later, it was summertime, and we get this really late delivery of a bunch of dairy items. The head chef received all and then had me start to unload it. This is at 8.45 p.m. I told him, Chef, just to be clear, Miss Weatherby said that I have to clock out at 9. Chef, well, I need this thing unloaded. Me, I've got 15 minutes and then I get in trouble if I'm not clocked out. Chef, do your best. 8.46 p.m. Go get the dolly. The dolly was taken by the banquet people. So I find it and start moving stuff. 8.53, first load on the dolly. 8.58, unload it and back to the pallet. At 8.59, I stopped what I was doing, left it all there, and walked directly to the punch card machine. 9 p.m. on the dot, I punched out. The next day, I got a call from the hotel's general manager asking me why I left all the dairy on the pavement. It was left out overnight, and hundreds of dollars worth of stock was spoiled. Yes, I had to clock out at 9 p.m. GM, did you think it was a good idea to leave the milk outside? Me, no. GM, then help me understand why you didn't put everything away. Me, Miss Weatherby was very specific that I was not to clock out late to unload pallets. She said that's not my job. GM, did it occur to you that the chef needed to know this? Me, I told him I needed to clock out at 9 p.m. GM, we've lost hundreds of dollars and wasted all this food. Me, I would like to go back to the way it was instead of having to clock out right at 9 p.m. on my evening shifts. GM, don't do this again. Clock out when the job's done. Outcome, nobody ever mentioned it, and from then on, I clocked out when I needed to. Not a real juicy outcome, but it was still nice to have happened. It doesn't hurt to ask. You're no better off if you didn't ask at all. I, 42, am at his store. Let's just call it Wally World just buying candy for an upcoming spooky holiday. I don't work at the store and I have a green shirt on. I was browsing when an older man and a six foot tall boy, older man might be about 70 or so, come up to me out of the blue and asked where to find strawberries. We are in the right area and I know where the fresh fruit is and walked him over. Older man, no, I wanted strawberries for strawberry shortcake. I have not had any in many years. He gets flustered and says he wanted a more creamy strawberry. I say sorry, but I didn't work there, and I was not sure what he meant. I felt bad as he wandered off to look for others to help him. I watched him walk off, then got an idea of pie filling, and ran to the baking aisle to find the strawberry filling. After I go off to find him, I found him a little later, 
at the frozen strawberries, getting slightly upset about how they wouldn't be right either since the pieces would be too big. I tap him on the shoulder and wave. Me. I found pie filling, showing him the can of filling. I use it when I want shortcake. Older man was smiling so bright. This will do great. Thank you. You're a great worker. Me, using my eyes to smile due to wearing my face mask. I don't work here. Why did you help then? Me, you asked me. Doesn't hurt to ask. You're no better off if you didn't ask at all. We part ways and I get to the candy aisle and I find the good candy up high. I go to try and climb up. I'm five feet tall to reach the big pack of normal candy bars when a tall teenage boy comes up and helps me get them down. Me, thank you. Teenager, no problem. You helped with my grandpa in being able to enjoy his favorite snack later with us. He asked me to help you. He wanted me to say to you, it don't hurt to ask. The teen walks back to his grandpa and we give a small wave. That time I accidentally facilitated a divorce by answering the restaurant phone. I started at my current restaurant gig 11 years ago and I was just reminded of something pretty wild that happened in my first year there. We had a couple of married bar regulars. I'll call them Jack and Jill. They were very frequent regulars, the type you see two or three times a week. I had gotten to know them by face and name after a few months, but we weren't close to any level where we'd have extended conversations about our lives. While closing up at the end of a shift, a coworker found Jill's phone left behind where they had been sitting. The screen was passcode locked, so we set it aside with the plan to return it the next time they came in. A couple of days later, and I was working the bar at the beginning of our dinner shift, and the phone rang. I just so happened to be the one to answer. Hi, thanks for calling Captain K234's restaurant. How can I help you? Hi, Captain K234. This is Jack. Is Jill there? No, she's not, but it's good luck that you called. We have her phone here. A brief pause from Jack, and then, which phone is that? Because she forgot her phone. I'm looking at it right here. That's why I'm calling the restaurant number. It turned out, Jill had been cheating on Jack for months, and she happened to leave behind her cheating phone. Jack found out that day because he talked to me. They were separated within days. In the immediate weeks after, Jill won our restaurant in the divorce, as seems to happen when regular customers break up. But after about six months, she stopped showing up. Someone must have eventually told Jack it was safe because he came in a few years later and told us all the sordid details. My entitled mother wants me to buy my little brother video games. I have so many stories about my mother and her entitlement, but this one is the most recent one. From ruining my high school graduation to putting people down every possible way. Good thing I moved out when I got the first chance away from all of her toxicity. So, people in the story. Warshadow91, yours truly. Entitled mom, my oh-so-persuading mom, and we've got my little brother. So I haven't been to my parents' house in months due to everything that's been going on, and the fact that my mom and the rest of her side of the family continue going out and going on vacations without any worries of their kids or for my grandparents. But enough about that, let's get to the main story. This year, with my income tax money, I made a custom-built PC so I can do some PC gaming, so most of my games are done through PC, since almost all games coming out are going cross-play. For people that don't do gaming, it means you can play with people on Xbox and PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, and in some cases, even mobile cell phones. So I barely spend any money on consoles or games for consoles for that matter. But I still play with people on my Xbox since some friends don't like the whole PC scene due to constant cheating. Little brother. Warshadow, are you going to get the new Xbox Series X? Me. Yeah, I might get it, but closer to the holiday seasons. Little brother. Are you going to get the new Call of Duty game? Me. I might, but if I do get it, it'll be for the PC since it offers crossplay. Maybe later I'll get it for the Xbox Series X once there is a special or if I win a gift card or something from everything I buy at Best Buy. Little brother. You should buy the cross-gen bundle. That way I can also play it. Little context on this. My Xbox account is on his Xbox as my home console. So the gold account and any game I buy, he can use it for free without any worries. And I never asked him for a cent before. Me. Nah, I'll buy it later. And like I told you on the Xbox, but not right now. Or you can pay for half of it and I'll pay the other half. That way you can get the game on your Xbox and I can get it on my Series X. 
I thought this was a good deal. We won't pay full price for the game, and he'll get it, and I'll get it, and I'll just wait later on in the year to buy it for my PC. Sadly, the first person he went to to ask for money was my mother. She hates me selling stuff to my brother, especially since she thinks since we're family, the stuff he gets from me should be free. Entitled Mom Wall Shadow, what's this about you charging your brother so he can play a game? I told her the gist of it, and that usually it's $59.99 plus tax for a game. But for $10 more, he'll be able to play it on his Xbox, and I'll be able to play it on my Xbox Series X once I get it. She went off. Well, if you are buying the game, then he should only give you $10 to play it. I told her, yeah, it's a $10 difference. But I told her I was planning on getting the game on PC instead. But if he was willing to pay half of it, I would pay the other half. And I did say multiple times I've never charged him for using my gold account and my games on his console before. Entitled Mom That doesn't matter. He should only pay you $10. So get that version and I'll give you the $10. I was livid. It's not the $10. It's the principle of him being responsible. I did this so he would help my mom out at the house since he is at home all day and does nothing. That way he can get an allowance and learn to appreciate hard earned money. But she's not getting it. I told her, you know what, I'm not getting anything, and if I do get it, the game will be for my PC. End of story. Entitled Mom. See? I told you to never ask him for anything. I just facepalmed and walked away. Speaking of gaming, do you play any video games? And if so, which ones? Please let us know. Breath of the Wild for the win. You got the rolls from where? When I was in my early 20s, I waited tables. The restaurant was open till 11 p.m. on weekends and 10 p.m. on weeknights. Well, one Friday night we were insanely busy and had run out of nearly everything. We had a really weird random busy week compared to most weeks. Anyways, this family of 5 or 6 comes in at 10.45 p.m. and sits in our smoking section. I was running the smoking section that night and had two other tables already there but finishing up. I walk up and greet the table. They start asking about the specials and I tell them and let them know that we do have a limited menu at this time as we've run out of many of the things. They tell me it's no problem. I take their drink order and run to grab them. While I'm back there, I grab some rolls, only there aren't any. I ask if more rolls are in the oven and I'm told no by the owner. I tell him I have a six top wanting rolls. He tells me that we're not cooking more rolls tonight as they will just get thrown out. I say okay and inform my table that I'm sorry but we're out of rolls for tonight. The dad goes off and says to fix more. I tell him I already asked and the owner said no more rolls tonight and it was out of my control. My manager was standing at the hostess podium listening in. I take their food order and it was a process because they wanted pretty much everything we were out of. I finally get their order and the kitchen cooks it like they ordered. My manager helps me bring it out and stays close by in case they cause problems. They say everything looks great and we walk away. I come back after a few minutes to check and I see the dad rummaging around on the other table that had just left. He walks back over to his table with a basket of bread from the other table and they start chowing down on the rolls. I'm appalled at this. Why would you take food off another table that someone had eaten at? I ask if everything is tasting fine. The dad says no, that the rolls are cold and hard and that his steak isn't cooked right. I say, oh, I'm sorry. I can get the steak fixed for you if you'd like. He says no, but he wants fresh rolls. I told him he wasn't getting any rolls, and I asked him where he got the rolls on the table. He said from over there and points to the recently vacated table. I looked at him and said it was gross to eat food from someone else's table because you don't know what they did to the food and served him right that the rolls are cold and hard. I walked away and went and said something to the manager. The owner overhears this and asks where this table is at. I tell him the smoking section. He takes his apron off and walks over there and stands and listens while he restocks the hostess podium with menus and cleans the silverware table and generally cleans my whole section for me. While he's cleaning my section up, he's observing this family while my manager and I are watching close by. This family has made quite a mess at their table, so I walk up and ask if I can get any plates out of their way. The dad says no and tells me to get him his dang check. The owner pops up at this and turns around with this furious look on his face. I placed the check down and said, here you go sir, with a smile and stand there to wait while shaking my head at the owner like, I got this. He walks over to where the manager is and watches. 
Dad pays, but not before complaining about the bill and lack of good food quality. I make change at the hostess podium and the owner comes up and grabs it from me. He walks over to the dad and says, here's your change. Now leave and don't come back to my restaurant. You've treated this young lady with absolute disrespect for doing her job and I won't tolerate it. Do not come back, ever. They take their time in leaving and when they do, we start cleaning off their table. They didn't leave a tip. I didn't expect one honestly with them, but they left a penny and a glass of water that was turned upside down. I noticed they were standing outside watching us. I knocked the cup of water into our bus bin and picked up the penny, dried it off, and walked to the front door and unlocked it and went outside to them. I threw the penny at them because they were laughing and pointing at me and told them to keep the dang thing because I didn't want a single cent from them due to their lack of manners, respect, and overall lack of being a decent human being. I walked back in and locked the doors and finished helping clean the table off. Manager and owner were shocked. Owner said, Well, little Miss Sweet and Innocent isn't Miss Sweet and Innocent like I thought. And I laughed and said, I may look sweet and innocent, but I'm a pit bull when I get angry. It was the first time him and my manager had heard something like this out of my mouth. Word got around the restaurant about this table and how I handled it, and everyone was glad I didn't take crap from them. Support our channel by joining as a member today, and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.